you heard there, right? okay, yeah cool, cool. Uh, my nightmare is that like just for whatever reason it doesn't work and then it's like oh no you know you lost the whole thing or whatever yeah so, you always hear about that have you lost any any uh, interview time at all with anybody no i mean there was one time uh when i was talking to jason copland like it was kind of funny um like every once in a while i'll have to cough or like i'm um, standing up to like walk around and stretch my legs so i put i push there's like a little button on my microphone that i i could totally turn off it's like muting the thing and uh i did that and then he was talking for a while and then he stopped talking and then like I had like a really good, I forget what it was about, but it was like a really good rant, right? I felt very passionate about it. And it was like a really good rant. It was probably, you know, you know, 30, 40 seconds long. And then he's just like sitting there in silence. And I'm like, okay, you know, I, you know, I didn't know. Was that, and, was like, and then I realized like, oh, like I could, you know, I, it didn't, I didn't lose that much. I probably lost like a minute. And then I realized what had happened. And then we quickly recovered, but. Uh, it's just kind of funny, but uh, yeah, I haven't lost uh, any like, you know, two hour full thing yet, but I'm getting to the point where my computer is just like getting bogged down or like now it's starting to be, it's probably like 20 gigabytes or something like that of just like these conversations and I'm going to have to, they're on the cloud, but I'm going to have to delete them off my computer. And that's what I'm kind of a little nervous about is I don't love the idea. Yeah. I guess I'm up to like 10 gigabytes now. So, right. Right. Yeah. That stuff adds up real fast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I do this, I'm now on episode 12, I think 13 was the Ibrahim one. So I, you know, I'm going to, I'm doing it every week and I'm pretty much going to do it forever. So at a certain point, it's going to be like a hundred gig, you know, at a certain point I'm going to have to just have it all be on the cloud. And that kind of scares me a little bit because I, I don't know how secure I feel about that, but uh, yeah, it doesn't seem real. For sure. I still have like, you know, physical hard drive backups, but um, I'm still, yeah, I still can't help but imagine just like losing a bunch of files or something like that. Right. I mean, even as I'm talking about it, it's like they're all posted on, you know, Spotify and Apple and whatever. The ones I have to worry about are the ones that I've banked, like what, how we're about to talk right now. Right. Like this probably won't come out for like several weeks. So if I lost this, then that would be super annoying because now it just it's it's not going to be on Spotify. It'll just be gone. So those are the ones I maybe what I should do is just not even worry about the ones I've already posted. And it's the ones that are that are banks that are that are scary. But uh, anyway, probably all of this is going to be cut out of the podcast. Anyway, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, I'm here with uh, Malachi Ward, um, artist, writer. He's worked on. Uh, ancestor uh which was published it was ser serialized in island initially and then collected by image um in 2016 uh he worked on expansion which is uh again serialized in profit later collected uh through image uh he also worked on i guess expansion was probably part of profit but he worked on profit and uh the big thing he's doing right now is um black hammer right i mean he's doing uh black hammer the end and um also you worked on star trek right yeah i've done uh a lot of star trek covers and then one like short uh star trek thing that matt and i wrote and drew uh just for like a you know one of the anthology issues but mostly covers for star trek and then yeah just finished up uh black hammer the end the trade comes out the end of july for that one okay cool so are all the the all the floppy issues are, are published already yeah those are all done okay interesting how, and what how many issues was that like uh six or seven yeah that was six and then matt and i did some issues of uh the previous run uh black hammer reborn hmm. uh and then we also did just like a one shot that colin bunn wrote um in, it was called Black Hammer Visions. So there's a lot of Black Hammer stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I was uh, researching about that a little bit. I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I was just thinking, like, it's kind of incredible how many, um, 
how many like spinoffs and I don't even know if spinoff is the correct word. Like it's the amount of different uh, mini series involved in the Black Hammer universe is kind of like really kind of incredible, actually. Like it's uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of. Um, I don't know if you remember like Seven Soldiers, uh, the Grant Morrison. Um, oh, yeah. I've never read that one. But yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that one. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it reminds me of that a little bit, but see, the, the thing is, like, actually, it's kind of like diminishing Black Hammer a little bit to even make that comparison because, like, it's like Black Hammer is way more like there is, you know, it's like Seven Soldiers was probably like one year or two years. This is now running since like Black Hammer is running since like 2016. So it really is uh, kind of an incredible, like, um, I want, you know, I'm not sure if the term like indie superhero universe is totally correct because it's coming out through Dark Horse, but it's independently owned, you know, uh, by right. Jeff Lemire, you know, um, but anyway, I don't yeah. want to get too ahead of myself because I do want to <laughs> talk about that like fairly in depth. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's always a little bit of a blurry line with the like, you know, or a matter of perspective, I guess, on what's what's a mainstream book and what's an indie book but um yeah that that like the last volume that i just finished up that's i mean i didn't draw i only drew like a tiny part of the whole series but that's right. volume volume eight of like the main black hammer story and then there's a ton of right yeah there's like contained mini series um in addition to those eight volumes so yeah there's yeah, a lot there's... of there's like Colonel Weird, there's Barbalian. Yeah. There's uh Sherlock Frankenstein and the Legion of Evil. There's like literally there's like 10 of them and uh I don't know, it's just kind of like incredible that you know, it's like uh again, I don't want to get too deep into the Black Hammer stuff too early cuz I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's just kind of incredible like I'm sure, you know, I don't know. Not to be that guy but like if i'm hbo or something i'm like this is like a gold mine right here you know what i mean like yeah you know, i'm sure <laughs> like i'm sure jeff is probably he's a deep i'm sure he's probably talking to somebody somewhere about this uh, you know it's like uh yeah i think at one point there was <clears throat> it had gotten somewhat far along but i don't i don't really know <laughs> yeah no plus, I hear it, he's been yeah. doing he's been doing um uh, the like sweet tooth i think the final right. season of that just came out and he and jeff like show ran oh uh, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that wow not not for sweet tooth but for um uh essex county right okay. yeah oh, okay uh that was like a yeah like a uh on like canadian tv i think um but yeah, he's been he's been very busy the last <laughs> few years. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, um, he's super in demand. I mean, I'm I'm seething with jealousy right now, as I said. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but anyway, going back a little bit, um, what are like uh, what would you say are like the early comics that got you into comics, or maybe you're not even one of these guys that's like a early reader or whatever. I'm kind of uh in some ways i am uh so well i mean the first thing the first comic that i was really into was was newspaper stuff so like primarily calvin and Hobbes. Huh. Uh, i'm 40 years old and i feel like a lot of people my age you know calvin and Hobbes is like huge in the 90s um and i was just like obsessed with it when I was a kid um so you know I was reading it in the newspaper and then I was like getting the collections I was drawing my own comic strips that were you know very like thinly veiled ripoffs of Calvin and Hobbes hmm. uh, yeah so I was super into Calvin and Hobbes and um and just kind of comic, like, like newspaper comic strips in general. Um, like what kind of comic was, strips? Like, uh, like Garfield well, or, like, you know, 
I wasn't huge into Garfield, but I really liked the far side. And okay, I really liked, yeah. um, there was another one that was kind of a similar format, like that single panel gag thing um, uh, called Bizarro that I liked huh. a lot. Uh, there was another strip called Zits <laughs> that was uh, huh. one I really loved. Uh, but I read like uh, everything that was, you know, on that comics page um, in the newspaper. Far Side is a, is a really interesting one because it's like, isn't it? It's I guess it's technically not like a comic. It's like a cart. I guess you you probably would call it like a cartoon because it's just like a single image normally, right? Or yeah, yeah, it's always a, a like a single panel uh, with you know either there's like a caption at the bottom or, or right or there, yeah because be i read time. collections of far sides uh you know i was into that as well but it, it's just kind of interesting it's like we think of it like comics i guess but i guess technically it, it, it's, it's not, on the line <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah so i was super into that kind of stuff but i also i mean you know it's the 90s like superheroes are huge like they're like the x-men cartoon the batman cartoon right cards are like uh, like a huge thing like i had a bunch of superhero trading cards um so i loved superhero characters um and i had comics and i would read comics but it really was just like a small handful of just like kind of a random assortment of comics that i was just reading in my, you know, I had maybe like 20 comics or something like that. Huh. Uh, so I wasn't like collecting or like really like following comic storylines when I was a kid. Um, although let's like, uh, I think maybe like my 12th or 13th birthday, my grandma got me the, um, that Marvel's miniseries. The, oh, um, interesting. Yeah, like uh, Alex Ross and uh Yeah, Alex Kirk. Ross and Kirk Dick. And yeah. And I like loved that. Like I was really I, it just kind of like blew my mind that there could be a sort of like realistic like ground level you know, it's like a regular right. guy like, his perception of like all these like uh uh like famous godlike, Marvel. you know larger yeah. than life characters like for people who are not big time comic book readers like marvels was this uh series where it was like um illustrated by alex ross so it was extremely like realistic painter literally paintings um takes place like you know basically shows the origins and the like evolution of the marvel universe but like through the guy through the eyes of a guy who is um like a wartime like photo journalist so it's like very like malachi just said it's like very on the ground like you know a guy on the ground taking pictures of like giant man walking across the street or you know or you know um a sh sort of street level view of like um oh it'll be like uh namor you know fighting the human torch in the sky and you sort of get like a real there's like a humanity to it um right am i am i am i capturing that you think yeah yeah because there are basically these like kind of canonical huge events in like marvel comics in the in the mythology of marvel right comics. sort of like big milestones yeah so like galactus uh you know attacking earth in the fantastic four fighting him right. and like you just mentioned, like the Human Torch and Namor kind of fighting. That's that's sort of like the Golden Age Marvel Comics story. Um, and then there's like an issue that's kind of like the X-Men. Like, you know, now there are these heroes that are sort of despised by the common man. Um, there's uh, Spider-Man, you know, like witnessing i think the death of gwen stacy right kind of i mean when you're on even as you say it like you know the x-men one like you know even as you say it like i remember the cover was it you know isn't there like there's like a cover where like angel is like 
Angel, the X Man who has like wings, is like taking flight, like holding like a mutant child. I, I think, if I'm yeah. recalling correctly, and it's just very, yeah. it was very powerful, like uh, allegory for you know like racism and like you know it was. I, isn't there even a moment where yeah. the main character guy, the photojournalist guy, gets like caught up in the mob and like throws a brick at them or something? Or am I remembering that correctly? It's been a while since I've read it as well. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me I too. Think, I think he does have a little bit of a of an arc like that where he he starts out, you know, in a, I, at the very least suspicious frame of mind um, regarding mutants. And then kind of, uh, I can't remember if maybe they're sheltering a mutant kid or I, I, I might remember. be right yeah i mean i feel like anyone who's like a hardcore expert right now I is know, like is tearing great. their hair out but i mean <laughs> i'm but, right there with you that's like i can't you know i haven't read it in years but you know um but you know it's it's not the kind of story that you would immediately think like oh this would be a good thing for like a kid that kind of knows comics right but like here's kind of basically like the first like multi-issue story that he's gonna read like give this to this yeah you know like 12 year old kid it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that a kid like that would like but it was kind of perfect because it was sort of a yeah. good introduction to like the important points of marvel history and then like it, it was different enough from what i expected and there was that like level of like realistic you know like the like you mentioned these like really detailed realistic watercolor paintings yeah it's like photo realistic page. um so it's, it's an incredibly it perfect beautiful gift for me. i i loved it when i was when i was a, a kid um yeah so so all that to say like i was familiar with the mythology i love the characters again like I would draw like my my own characters and stuff like that that I wouldn't I wasn't drawing like superhero comics because that seemed like too complicated and difficult but uh I would make up a bunch of characters and kind of imagine the world and the stories that they uh would partake in but um that was for the most part my it wasn't until like uh, high school, I worked sort of near a comic book shop and it was, you know, like my first job or whatever. So I had like some money and then I started like buying comics. And that was in the like, uh, what was it? It was, it was when um, Kevin Smith was writing. Oh, okay. It was like writing Daredevil. Um, Daredevil. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so that's got to be like ninety nine, I think. Maybe yeah. two thousand. Yeah, yeah, late nineties, early two thousand, somewhere in there. Because I, because I, that was the first time where I was like following something as it was coming out. I was really into the Joe Casada art, um, and then I think after Kevin Smith, I think it was Bendis. Hmm. Yeah, so it, I'm pretty sure. And so I so I liked the Kevin Smith. I, I I don't even know if I came in maybe midway with the Kevin Smith stuff that just like a friend showed it to me. Um, and I, honestly, I don't even know that we knew who Kevin Smith was or cared about that. It really was the joke. Oh, interesting. Of, which was the reason why we were like, oh, this is cool. Um, uh, and so... Bendis came on and I think like around that time also uh is it David Mack is that the artist's name yeah 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 that worked with uh, during Bendis's uh yeah yeah Daredevil. and Tata was on part of that too and I anyway like that like again the like watercolor and the like collage and stuff like that as like a kid who's you know like a high school student that's kind of like I don't know, looking for like interesting art or something that doesn't feel like the normal kind of comic book art or whatever that was like intriguing to me. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, so that was kind of, and I didn't read a ton outside of that Daredevil, 
like in high school, I kind of was just reading Daredevil. I wasn't really reading anything else. Hmm. So yeah, and I guess uh, Alex Maleev also was during yeah, that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and I liked the Alex Maleev stuff a lot too. Uh, yeah, and then you know, like I went to college and I didn't read for maybe like the first couple years when I was in college. Um, but then it's actually, I think the librarian, <laughs> like one of the head librarians at the college I was at had this like group where they would go every Wednesday and get comics. And he started like lending me stuff to read. And that was, that's when I like started to really get into comics. Cause he was showing me like Hellboy and huh. he was like okay here's like the classics <laughs> like it was you know it was like an older guy that you know knew like really new comics and was showing me like here's the best stuff he was still like a mainstream reader but i was going in on wednesdays and then that's where i was kind of seeing like um well i actually bought you know that um the literary magazine uh mcsweeney's that's like a um like anthology of like short stories and stuff like that oh no yeah i'm not familiar it's it's been around for a while it, it was like really popular in the early 2000s um but they had a comics issue of mcsweeney's and it was like guest edited by chris ware and it had a bunch oh. of like Here's like the history of like newspaper comics. Um, and here's, and it like had uh, Chris Ware comics in there. It had like Kevin Knight Zanga, all these like alternative and like art comics people were in that. So I just like happened to pick that up at just a regular comic book store, mainstream huh. comic book store. And that's when it was like, oh, this is like, like art and literature and this is like this isn't just sort of like a fun thing i just kind of read on the side or whatever this is like something that's like uh could really be great or you know right is really, this is like a serious like, thing um and like that's when i started thinking like oh maybe i would like want to make something like this um that's so funny to think because, because it's it, like it connected it, to it connected to that like you know first kind of like love for calvin and Hobbes and newspaper strips and stuff like that because huh. he was like chris Ware is always talking about like crazy and ignats and like the golden age of newspaper strips in like the you know 1910s and stuff like that like gasoline alley and um things like that uh and little nemo so i like got super into that kind of stuff kind of towards the end of college huh yeah, man, I can. I, you know, I want. Like, are you a big Little Nemo guy? Because I could can maybe possibly see that as like a as an yeah, influence. Yeah, yeah. It's it. That was one of the first things where I was like, had kind of like a big <laughs> phase of of reading a lot of like, uh, yeah, the Little Nemo um, strips. Kind of right at the beginning, it was like it was that, and it was Chris Ware and uh, and Kevin Heitzenga. So like guys that were doing like crazy formal things. Um, and and like I said, like using like had maybe more literary and and uh, fine art kind of proclivities mixed in. Um, that that was what was really exciting to me at the time. That's interesting. It's just like you think like, you know, that's you know you you normally wouldn't see something like that in a comic book store so that's kind of a crazy uh like you know stroke of faith that you happen to find that there you know what i mean um like a lot of mainstream comic book stores uh, especially you know 20 years ago would not have that kind of stuff right wouldn't you say that's that's probably true yeah I, this was certainly not like a cool comic shop <laughs> that carried like a wide breadth of uh material but right I, like i, I imagine they just, probably didn't have a hundred copies of it or something like it was right <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah but i i think i think just at that time 
um that like that side of comics really was kind of booming also where it's like these big mm. chris Ware versions were coming out dan klaus books were i mean dan klaus books still sell really well but like that you know that that was sort of like right at the beginning of like oh the like you're gonna hear a dan klaus interview on like npr or like the you know regular radio station or something like that right like, it was um, kind of a bit of like uh you know marvel was having a big renaissance and kind of tied in with that sort of like comics are serious and for adults like in that you know you could kind of argue that that kind of explosion of like um comics are meant to be taken seriously and like you said the like interviews on npr and stuff and that, that sort of the almost like the rehabilitation of comic books um sort of led to where we are today i guess a little bit yeah definitely and the and it was all kind of, uh, I mean, it's not as big of a deal, or it's more common now, but at the time, like, these, you know, guys like Chris Ware and, um, and like, Adrian Tomine and, like, uh, they were getting, they were getting their books published with, like, real big book publishers. Which, right, like, it'd be, like, Random House, right, or, like, Penguin, or my, yeah, I'm pulling I mean, these names out of a hat, but and that's like continue that continues to happen now, but that was more of a rarity in the early 2000s. And then and then because a handful of those guys started to really sell well, um I remember there being like this um like kind of a race where like a bunch of people got uh book deals through uh non-comics book publishers and then it all and then like a a big wave of those books came out and they just didn't sell like mm. full of like top guys so it was it was around that like 2006 or 7 or somewhere in there where like a bunch of those books came out and then that was kind of the end of, like none of them sold that oh, so there was a bit, little bit of like a bubble burst it sounds like a little bit yeah yeah um and now I, I don't know. It feels like that side of comics is um, that side of comics feels a lot smaller than it did when I was uh, like fresh out of college or whatever. Um, I don't know if that's actually the case or that's just like my perception, but it it doesn't seem like the the like average kind of. Uh, NPR listener is is buying as many uh, alternative comics as they were, you know, fifteen years ago. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's I don't, yeah, it's hard to say. Really, like you said, I mean, we're all kind of like, you know, we're all kind of like trapped in our own algorithms a little bit. So it's hard to see. It's hard to tell if it's just this is what we're seeing in our own little our own little silos or whatever. But I hear you. You know, it, it seemed like. Uh, it seemed like there was a real explosion of that at that time. And, um, you know, I yeah, I think shortly after that, there was a big shift with cartoonists that worked in that way, where um, I think in the years since then, there's been a big shift where uh, the YA market blew up. And so a lot of people that maybe would have done a, um a I I am I don't know like a, a fan of graphics book for adults you know that that would have been kind of in that same book market that like a Chris Ware book would be in um maybe were incentivized to instead do um right like a, like a young adult type thing. book or, yeah yeah like a young adult book and I mean, they're, like, there are really good books that come out in that, you know, for that age group. But um, it seems like, yeah, that's maybe kind of where a lot of that kind of cartooning went. Huh. Um, yeah, it, it also, I also <laughs> wonder if uh, things are just, like, much more fragmented now where, like, um, there's so many 
like amazing artists and creators online that it's just like there's so many it's it's almost inconceivable and i know a lot of people just like are are making money just like oh i'm on webtoons you know like or you know it's uh you know what i mean like they they you don't necessarily need to have like a big publisher or book deal to be like thriving and stuff um and there's there's like so many tens of thousands of people like that um i don't know i guess it's uh yeah i, I think that i think that's a big part of it too is um yeah like 10 or 15 years ago or maybe even 20 years ago you know there was a lot yeah. of the kind of mainstream or not mainstream but a lot of the like book market comics people were talking about like oh there's this whole generation under us that's like reading comics online reading they're coming up more reading stuff online, reading manga primarily. Um, so like, what's that going to mean for when, when those people start making comics? And I think that's what happened. I think, you know, a lot of the people that grew up like that are making more YA work and making more like webtoons, like stuff for webtoons or stuff that, you know, if it gets to the book market, it's more of kind of like a secondary thing for them. It's not their primary focus. Right. Yeah. Um, so when, when were you uh, sort of like starting to dip your toe, like um, in the industry, like in the actual comic book industry, like what was the, what was the moment when you were like, okay, I'm actually going to make a comic book and, and you know, like what was that book? And you, you did like some creator own stuff before you started to like get more into like mainstream work, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, I was, I, the thing that I kind of like became really obsessed with was more of that um, like alternative comics, art comics uh, scene. So I was, um, I was, uh, Oh, my dog's coming through. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was, I wanted to make that kind of work and, and kind of the cool way to do that was to just like make your own zines and self-publish and, you know, so I was just like at kind of at the end of college, just like um, I wanted to make comics, but it still sort of seemed impossible or there's just a lot to figure out about it. So I just kind of, I would make things and not finish them or, you know, um, I think it took like a couple years before I finished a story called Utu, which was just like a 30 page comic. And I printed it up at the, like, I wasn't even going to school in my, at my, at the university anymore, but I printed it up at the like print shop there and then, um, took it to alternative press expo which was a san francisco show i drove up there um and so yeah it was a few years of just like self-publishing and then matt and i who matt went to the same school as me so we knew each other from that um we started doing expansion and that expansion initially was just self-published um oh, okay and then uh, I think it was, yeah, from that, it was when um, Simon Roy was making, was making similar kinds of, you know, science fiction stuff as, as Matt and I. Um, so we were kind of talking to him on and off. And then, yeah, when they started doing profit, uh, they asked us to do backup stories so we started doing backup stories and then we started doing um actual interior pages for profit of like the main story so that was our first like um that was our first like direct market published work i had had like short stories and stuff published in like some fanographics anthologies and there used to be a uh, there used to be a thing called the best American comics. Right. You know, it was, it was just like an anthology of stuff that had come out the year before. Right. Yeah. So that, like, that, was kind of a, that was kind of in the back of my head when you were saying like that, that sort of thing doesn't exist anymore. I was trying to think of that. Like that's not around anymore. Right. 
Right. Yeah. 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 That's a that's actually a pretty good kind of indication of a a part of uh, the comics world that doesn't seem like it's as as kind of in the mainstream consciousness as it used to be. Right. Yeah. Because um, I that used to be fairly big. Yeah. 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 I'm. Yeah. You used to be able to go into you know any bookstore it would have the best American comics. Uh, huh. and so yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I had like short stories and anthologies that were published before that, but um, those were all kind of more the book market type stuff. Um, and then, yeah, uh, uh, Profit was the first um, like comic book store type of a comic that uh, ever got published so so what was that experience like where like okay now your work is in you know comic book stores that's like a huge um you know not to use a pun but that's like a huge expansion of like you know the reach of your work is now you know magnified you know many thousands of times over um you know and profit was a huge uh hit book at the time right i think it's fair to say yeah yeah um and it was it was at a time in the in like um in monthly comics where like a lot of people that hadn't read comics in a long time or had never read comics were getting into monthly comics. Like image was just like it was kind of during that time of like saga was just coming out, like a bunch of like the really big Marvel and DC writers, like all kind of started doing an image series um of right, their own. like matt fraction you yeah. know this is probably when this may have been pre jonathan hickman even being at marvel but this was really the probably during the era of jonathan hickman kind of uh rising to prominence um like yeah, you said so like think, yeah like brian k vaughn i guess that more was uh was li why the last man was probably dark horse i want to say but you know it's sort of you know sort of in that it's indie com it's like mainstream indie comics is maybe what it should be called you know what i mean it's not it's not really indie but it sort of is you know what i mean and you know image and and i guess probably to a lesser extent dark horse were like really having like a big explosion of that at the time yeah definitely yeah this was the like you know what 2013 14 15 in that kind of area when when profit was was at its biggest so there's still um like even though matt and i only did you know a very limited number of pages <laughs> for um profit um just because we were like part of that crew there's a you know there's a lot of people that still at like a show and stuff like that they'll be like that was like my first comic or that was the thing that kind of you know, it was a wild science no. fiction comic that, you know, incorporated a lot of things from a lot of things that you hadn't seen in sci-fi comic books before, you know? No, um, definitely. I mean, it looms large in my imagination and it's kind of, I, I really think it was a, a very important moment in comics where like, I think a lot of people like, you know, like you mentioned Simon Roy, like, um, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation of his name and feel like an idiot, but, uh, Giannis, uh, M Milianis, you know, uh, you know, got, got a start in that as well, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like your, you know, yourself, you know, like uh, already I'm saying, you know, like I've worked with, uh, like Daniel Irizarry several times and he, he, I'm pretty yeah. sure his first published work was, um, like backups and profit. And, uh, you know, there's, it's sort of, uh, I don't know. You probably don't want to get into this too much, which I totally respect and understand, but it's sort of a little bit sad that like the legacy of profit is kind of tarnished a little bit by like, you know, Brandon Graham kind of, uh, you know, having, uh, like, <laughs> like I'm trying to like, you know, walk on a, on a tight rope above, above, uh, <laughs> you know, a black hole basically. But, uh, <laughs> You know, having like a public meltdown, I think it's fair to say, and then and you know, yeah. sort sort of canceling himself, sort of. Um, yeah, yeah. And so through that, you know, 
you know, I feel like the legacy of profit is kind of impacted a little bit. And I don't even know, you know, I don't know if you, you know, uh, I'm completely just digging myself a deeper, deeper hole here as I continue to talk about it. No, I, I, you know. I, think that, I think that definitely played a big role in the perception of profit. But then I think it even kind of outside of that, like it was part of, like I was saying, that wave of image books that were really huge. And then kind of all of them, um, you know, started coming out uh, more sporadically. And, um, right. you know, like the whole that, that, and there weren't, there wasn't kind of like the waves of titles after that, that initial kind of uh, boom at image didn't kind of capture audiences in quite the same way. Um, so I think that's kind of part of it too, is just that a, a lot of those series kind of just faded a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm it, sure in, the, in another like s 10 years or something like that, then maybe people will have kind of, uh, the, the perception of the, those comics from those years will have stabilized at some point, but, uh. Yeah, they're they're a little bit kind of like like the legacy has been tarnished a little bit by you know Brandon kind of famously had like I don't even know how you describe this. So all I could say is anyone listening to this, pl please do not be mad at me. That's that's the main the main message, <laughs> the main tech take home message is not to be mad at me personally. But Brandon had a little bit of like I think you could it's I think it's fair to say like a transphobic like or i guess like you know he had a meltdown where he you know people criticizing him about his treatment towards a trans person um you know he had a meltdown where he made you know sort of uh little comic book pages that were like clapping back at his critics and he it was sort of like he was in quicksand a little bit it's kind of like a little bit of a lesson in what how not to react to like a public uh controversy um and I think because of that, the legacy of profit was kind of tarnished a little bit. But then you think, you know, like you said, people still come up to you and, you know, and they still remember it. And I think people can sort of separate the work from the artist a little bit that, you know, it's like Simon, like guys like Simon and yourself, like did incredible work on that book. And it's sort of not, you know, sort of not all about Brandon. And you know what I mean? And it's sort of, you know, it's I don't know. Yeah, there um, were a lot. There are a lot of artists that worked on that book and worked on kind of related or like Island and stuff like that. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, I think people, I don't think, at least not that I've noticed there, there hasn't really been people that are like, I don't know. Fuck that book because and that guy <laughs> yeah, yeah. created it. Like, it, this is also a tough thing that, uh, you know, I think about this sometimes. Like, I'm not, I want to be totally clear. I'm not like defending brandon uh, i'm not being like a you know a fence sitter or whatever but uh i do think like sometimes like if we were to go back in history and be like all right do you think ernest hemingway was like a good guy <laughs> like you know like it was like if you <laughs> like if we look all right let's look at like okay do we think shakespeare like would hold up to like today's modern uh you know uh, conceptions of morality like he was probably a bad guy <laughs> like you know like i feel <laughs> confident saying like you know so i'm saying like you know i think we have to a little bit be like yeah it, it, you know it's uh there's some stuff that i personally don't feel comfortable supporting you know like for instance um I, I don't even want to say it for instance like that's uh that's how that's touchy it is there's certainly there's i think everyone has to um you know almost on like a case-by-case -case basis like there are some well let's say in like movies well uh, let me throw there out are some one directors example. that i know are terrible and are still terrible and i'm still personally kind of like fine watching and enjoying their movies and then there are other directors that are terrible 
uh, and I don't want to watch their movies anymore. Like, it, right, like just you know, the nature of their personality and the subject of their work and stuff like that. Like, I just am. I don't like doing it anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I'll say like you know a couple of examples that occur to me is like I'm not gonna like financially support like Woody Allen, for instance. Like, I'm you know I'm not really. I don't care. Right. Like, I could just watch anything else. So like, another example is like ender's game like I, I think you know i think orson scott card is known to he's like a big time mormon and i think he's known to like uh he donated to like homophobic stuff i think uh okay I'm trying to quickly even look it up as i'm saying so i don't i don't get uh anyone mad at me but um <laughs> yeah i mean he's had public statements and writings that are considered to be homophobic yeah and so you know because of that when the ender's game movie came out like i'm not gonna, i don't want to put money in his pocket you know what i'm saying like right right you know but uh, you know uh, but on the other hand like plenty of people read ender's game and it's like very precious to them and i, I wouldn't be like you know fuck you you're a terrible person you know what i'm saying like I, you know i think every person has to sort of you know make a judgment call about that that kind of thing like how much do you want to support something that you know maybe the author or creator has kind of yeah. now become and, like morally tarnished and i think for me it's not even so much an issue of like uh financially supporting a work by like paying for something like that that kind of thing I don't know. It, it doesn't seem like it has much impact one way or the other. Like, right. Yeah, it is. Like, you know, it's a, to me, know, I think it's, it's, more of just, it's just the personal kind of like, um, you you're know, not into it. You don't, bit, you don't like it. You don't enjoy it. Like, so yeah, why yeah, punish like, yourself by like, like by choking it down or whatever. Right. Like I'm the same way with Woody Allen where it's like, um, it's not like I was like a huge Woody Allen fan, but I liked some of his movies and I just don't ever want to watch any of them anymore. Yeah. It's like, like a bad taste in your mouth now. I, I yeah. do think, you know, uh, you and know, I so do, many I do of think... them, so many of them are like about, you know, like, right. Dating a much younger woman. And stuff, and I'm just like, it's gross. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like even looking back on it, isn't like Annie Hall, like, Oh, he's 40. Annie Hall is like 19 or something. Isn't that, isn't that kind of, I think so. Either? Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, I just don't want to hear from that guy. Like, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, whereas like, yeah, I don't know. There are other directors that have probably done, you know, objectively worse things but if the movie they're they've made or something like that is not as directly kind of related to the person that they are or the things that they've done right, I, right. i'll watch it and i want right. you know it's not like i'm like wow this guy's great or something like that but that's like, sort of the point i'm making a little bit about profit where it's like you know it has nothing to do with him personally you know what i mean or you know it's kind of that was kind of the point I was making right. a little bit about like Shakespeare, like, you know, I think we could probably, I mean, you know, by, you know, <laughs> I think probably any adult, adult male in like, whatever the, the 1500s <laughs> when Shakespeare was working was probably by today's standards was like, uh, you know, a misogynist, like a bad guy, you know, like, or, you know, sure. just generally a bad guy, like by today's standards, you know, like. Um, and and also just at that point it it starts to be just like actual like history you know like you can have like a anthropological appreciation for right, something right 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 it's not really it's very connected to you're you, not you know, endorsing versus someone that you're like you know potentially get you know comics is like a small world yeah he's so. still yeah he's <laughs> still walking around today I and mean, he, he still yeah. uh kind of reminds you of like uh <laughs> This is like a funny little sidetrack to go on, but it kind of it reminds me of like uh like Matthew Perry before he died, like kind of had a minor controversy where he was like he's he's he had in his book some line where he was like, oh, you know, it's such a tragedy that you know <laughs> some people die before their time, and then Keanu Reeves is just allowed to walk the earth among us, like you know, it's like I don't know. <laughs> 
just like the whole that, that to me i do that, kind of vaguely remember that yeah yeah that I, killed me at the time just the idea of like Ke keanu reeves is allowed to walk the earth among us <laughs> i think he said it's just kind of funny. that is a weird shot to take <laughs> yeah it's, it's weird too because by all accounts you see he's almost like you know by the standards of yeah. yeah by the standards <laughs> of celebrities he seems to be like a minor saint i guess like yeah yeah uh, Keanu Reeves. so i mean i feel bad taking a shot at matthew perry uh, you, you know who himself has now tragically died so uh yeah know, i, I mean it's that bad. weird thing of that happens on the internet where um and social media where i mean obviously this is not a new idea or anything like that but um a, a weird thing that a guy says just sort of becomes fodder for people to kind of like pat themselves on the back for for being like right, right about yeah <laughs> it's like when someone and, has and a bad is... take yeah man i've thought about this a lot and you know and, and to you know I'm saying about the Matthew Perry thing. I, I, at the time, I think I made some kind of tweet, kind of like making fun of it a little bit. Because to me, to me, I just love the phrase that I love that he used the phrase like he's allowed to walk the earth among us. Like I, I it still sticks <laughs> yeah. in my mind. It's like a great like just it's like it's funny to me. But uh, there's I, definitely I, sorry. It's a rich source of like there's plenty of jokes to be made because it's such an odd. <laughs> right yeah it's so yeah the phrasing of it is 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 great but uh i yeah, get what you're saying though it's like sort of like outrageously humble for no reason but, yeah um, like it's so it's like almost camp or like arch or something but uh yeah yeah i get what you're saying that it's like yeah i mean there is a thing where like someone says something like insanely like outrageously dumb and then now there'll be ten thousand tweets about it and sometimes that kind of bums me out a little bit because it's like you know i follow all, all these artists like yourself included like I, I follow uh like all these people and sometimes i see people like struggling to get attention on like the latest like piece of art they posted or whatever or maybe they're sharing like their their kickstarter campaign or something and then meanwhile it's like oh marjorie marjorie taylor green says the moon is made out of cheese or something and then it's like oh yeah hundred thousand likes like you know, it's, uh, yeah, you know, and I'm certainly, I mean, like, I love reading about, like, cults or like, uh, like, um, or even just like, oh, interesting. you know, reading like debunkings of like, you know, flat earthers or things, yeah, you know, like, yeah it's the same impulse. Like I totally understand the impulse because it's very comforting. Like if there's lots of like complex issues where you feel like you're right about that right. issue and, uh, and the, there are other people that are out there that are wrong. Um, it's still right. maybe like, it's like a real nuanced issue and maybe that person really is definitively wrong and you really are definitively right but it's like a complicated issue that other people can reasonably disagree with you on so it's very comforting to find these things where it's like someone said something that is objectively dumb i can look at all the ways that they're wrong and kind of you sort of reaffirm really your own position like, and yeah i i at least i might not be a hundred percent on everything but i can be a hundred percent about this at least at least i know that the earth is round <laughs> you know right yeah um, i mean it's funny um uh it's so funny that we're getting into this because um this is actually like a little bit of like a guilty pleasure for me like this exact thing that we're talking about and i've been trying recently like all right you know my life like i'm getting older like my life is finite like you know <laughs> it's like why am i spending time in this like for example um you know, there's a couple reddits that's like, I'm not endorsing these reddits. I'm saying it's a guilty pleasure for me. Like, uh, like I'll look, for example, at like the Joe Rogan Reddit. And I, I am saying Joe Rogan, I'm saying unambiguously, I think he's like a bad guy. Like, I think like, you know, I think I'm saying that totally flat out 
I think he's a bad guy and he's like a bad influence on society and I don't like him. And I'm saying that, but I still look at like, I look at the Joe Rogan Reddit because like, you know, just off the top of my head, something he said recently was like, Oh, um, you know, like uh face masks should be illegal or something, you know? And then I'll go, I'll go. He literally said that. And then I'll go into like that thread and I'll be like, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the people arguing about it. And the Joe Rogan Reddit is actually really interesting for the exact reasons that you're saying, because I go there, not because I'm looking to see a bunch of people being like, yeah, he's right. They should be illegal. Like I go there because he actually has like a large amount of people on that Reddit, like getting into fairly nuanced discussion of how profoundly wrong he is. So it's exactly like what you're saying. It's like, I'm sort of reading a debate. There are some people who are, you know, debating on his side, there's usually a lot more saying how he's wrong. And so then I could kind of like think through like how, you know, it's sort of like reaffirming, you know, yeah. what I know to be true. And, so, and that, you know, during the height of the pandemic, that was especially something when like, you know, he was like extremely prolific about like, you know, in my view, literally like it, this is in my view, like, literally criminally irresponsible statements about like COVID and the vaccine and stuff. Like I, I honestly, it kind of drives me up a wall. Cause I, I feel like all the anti-vax anti COVID, or I don't even know what you call it. COVID denialist, perhaps COVID minimizers. Um, right. I feel like they basically just won, you know, and it's like a huge, <laughs> it's like a big bummer to me because it, you know, if you, if you think about it, um, I'm going on a whole tear about this, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> Fair, fairly recently, like a couple days ago, I just like did a little bit of research about this. And uh, in April, in April 2021, when Rogan was saying young people shouldn't get vaccinated, literally 3000 people were dying a day. <laughs> like How fucking nuts right. is that? That's like right. a 9-11 every day. And he's like, right. yeah, I don't know. Don't get vaccinated. You know, it's like. And that what we, where where is the congressional hearing about that? You know, like <laughs> and they got Fauci up there. Fauci is like, you know, this fucking thousand year old man who's retired anyway. So, you know, yeah. you know, I don't know. Yeah. No, I totally I mean, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's it's the exact uh, kind of thing you're talking about. I, I'm saying I'm saying this behavior on my part is bad like i should stop you know <laughs> like spend your mental energy like thinking about it like like anything else like i'm saying it's exactly what you're talking about that it's like there is like a little bit of like a sweet sour taste to being like yeah i'm right like it, you know i'm gonna read commenters on the internet like kind of reaffirm why i'm right and it's you know yeah I'm trying to i mean not do that i should say like i don't think it's like like a truly like awful thing to do obviously i do it also it i think it's just it's on the indulgent side <laughs> um, definitely it's right? like it, i'm saying it's like a guilty right. pleasure for me yeah um and I, it does seem like it's kind of one of the main mechanisms through which uh people's social media interactions particularly on twitter it's one of the main ways that they work because it is so satisfying to, uh, and so easy to sort of only engage with the dumbest version of your enemy <laughs> right? or the dumbest version of the people that disagree with you. Right. Um, I do wonder so you, sometimes, you kinda, um, you know, sorry. Eh, I don't know. Like I, I, I'm just repeating myself at this point, I guess, no, but I yeah, you. it just, it feels good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, another one is like, um, <laughs> another one is like, I look at like the, there's like a, re there's a subreddit just called like conspiracy. And, yeah. you know, if you ever want to look at that and just be like, <laughs> like the people on there just like have the most insane like worldview imaginable. And it's exactly, you know, sort of what you're describing. It's like, uh, there probably is some flat earth on there, but it's all, it's, it's just, it's, you know, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, uh, sorry. I mean, on the good side of it, I think there is, 
I think it is good to have a clear understanding of why you think what you think. <laughs> right. No, I, you and, know, I will say about the anti-vax stuff, like part of it for me is like, you know, I have looked at like, I've gone out there looking for like, convince me that like the vaccine is bad. Like I've looked for it. I've never, you know, I'm not one of these guys who are just like, I just watch CNN and I just watch MSNBC. Like, you know, I've looked for <laughs> like, I'm looking yeah. for the smoking gun and I haven't found it. So, you know, I, then that it's exactly what you're saying. It kind of makes me, it kind of does. It's like, you know, uh, I think you should look at like opposing viewpoints, you know, but there is a, up to a point, you know, like. Now it's, uh, you know, it's like, what did the vaccine come out in 2021? Now it's three years later. Like, okay. Like now it's, it's indulgent. Like you said, you know, like yeah, how much I, do you need to pat yourself on the back for being right or whatever? And like I said, that I mean, like vaccine stuff and COVID stuff is like, it is one where you're kind of like seeking comfort and seeking like certainty and it's easier now because time has passed it was harder kind of in the middle of it because like you know it takes a while right. for experimentation and scientific research right. to uh you know get its hands around like oh the causes of something or the you know what exactly is happening um right the stakes are and, lower you know, now that's still, that's like... still happening but at the same time it's very you know i i am sympathetic to your frustration because i mean there was just like a big New York Times article that was kind of there wasn't any it's not like there was any new scientific information in it but it was just sort of you know a person that has always been a proponent of the lab leak theory kind yeah, of it was like an opinion publishing piece. a big thing in the New York Times about how they were right and then right. you know there's new in there and it's not like it's just so disconnected from like actual scientific research, like the public yeah, discourse, even on, you know, what is considered kind of like a, a liberal mainstream uh, media outlet, like the New York Times, you know, there's still kind of like weird narratives that they're, they're in, you know, well, for whatever reason, they think that's what re the readers want to, Right. I mean, See. that that was a funny one, because I'm again, I, like I said, like I, I'm trying to break myself of this bad habit of like looking at this stuff. But that was a funny <laughs> one where uh, that what you're talking about, I'm pretty sure it was like it was an opinion piece. So that's like there's a big distinction there between like like, you know, that's the kind of thing like anti-vaxxers would cling to and be like, See, even The New York Times is reporting about how it was really a lab leak. Well, no. They're not reporting it was a lab leak. They're like, you know, they have an opinion piece, which is a very different from like, you know, actual journalism. And like in the actual article, the guy's like, it seems like it could be right. possibly. Right. It's not saying like they don't, it's it's like you said, there's no new, you know, there's no new information. Um the lab leak one is funny because. You know, I, I guess we'll probably never know. Like, I'm open to that as a possibility, but I, I think overwhelmingly, like the scientific community, I think that they, um, I'm gonna fuck this up. There's like a certain term. It's like it's like a they know, like I think like, genomically or something. I'm fucking it up. There, there is a term that they <laughs> they know based on like the genetic inheritance of COVID that they're like they're highly confident that it has like it's called like zoonotic origin. Like they're highly confident that it was right. spread from like animals or whatever based on not just based on like vibes, you know, but based <laughs> on like, we could see that we, we've looked at the, like the genes of the virus and we could see a clear lineage, you know, and there's no, uh, you know, there's no, uh, little corporate symbol on the DNA indicate. No, I don't know. That's a made up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is a caveman understanding of how they figured it out, but um yeah, well, I mean that's the other side of it that is sort of one of the absurdities of so much discourse around stuff like this is like uh you know, none of us know what we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, no, and it's <laughs> it's it's, it's pretty know, it's, like uh, complex scientific <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's like a very it's a very scary time we're in because it's like 
there is this crazy distrust of like it's like oh like you're an expert like don't you think that means you're biased well fuck, like you know like just you talk yeah. about like uh you talk about like Fauci, like, I don't think people not, nah, you know, this is so lame because I feel like I'm like sucking up to like the school nurse or something. Like it doesn't look, <laughs> it doesn't look cool. Like it's not, it's not a, like a sexy, you know, topic, but like people don't really understand. Like Fauci is actually like one of the, he's like, he's one of, if not the like top infectious disease doctors in the world. Like he's like, he's like insanely accomplished. Like if we were to go through, if I were to pull up his Wikipedia right now, it has like a list of long, as long as my arm of like his accomplishments, you know, this is a guy who's like, he's arguably, you know, he's arguably like one of the top, uh, I already said this, but one of the top infectious disease doctors in the world. And people are like, you know, throw him in jail. Like, it's like, <laughs> he's trying to help you motherfucker. Like what the fuck? Like, He's like in public service his whole life, you know, trying to protect you from like, you know, like fucking polio and shit like Ebola. Right. There is a there's a famous picture of him where like, I don't know, I guess this is probably during Obama's term, like that, like when they had like that, that uh, Ebola like outbreak, he, the guy like fucking suited up in a like a hazmat suit and was like treating people himself like that's <laughs> fucking like. And you're going to, that's like a fucking fireman running into uh, like a burning building, you know, like you're going to be like, you know, you're going to like uh, crucify him for that kind of shit. But uh, anyway, I feel like this is a terrible mistake to, to rant and rave about this for so <laughs> long, but maybe well, we should yeah. actually talk about comic books. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, here's maybe a tenuous connection, but I think, um, in general, when like the average person is outside of a certain culture and then like all of a sudden everyone wants to know about things from that culture. <laughs> um, right. It, I see the connection it, you're making. There this can be like a, 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 a severe misunderstanding. So like even people that are maybe pro Fauci or anti Fauci, a lot of the time they both have this kind of idea of like a monolithic super powerful right. science like community. The, right like the scientists it's, yeah like yeah kind uh, of all all doctors are in on it together or something yeah yeah um you know which is ridiculous <laughs> not really um and and that's something that you know a lot of conspiracy theorists they can only maintain their conspiracy because they have to sort of imagine um right there has to be a vast a network of people yeah all yeah in unified. on it together yeah yeah we're like oh yeah all the archaeologists are uh, right w working together to keep the truth from us or whatever or their egos are all so big that um but also so kind of uh dedicated to institutional power that um you know they won't uh accept counter evidence or something like that. right yeah and the funny thing is um you know if you were an archaeologist and you were able to prove like i don't even know like if you know you were able to prove like oh the egyptians were helping the mayans build you know pyramids or something you know like i guess that's Correct. the typical sort of graham hancock sort of uh or i don't even know what his idea is that i guess he, he probably thinks it's like fucking aliens or something i don't know but uh if you were able, if you were able to prove something that totally disproved uh, modern archaeological thinking about, for example, like the Egyptian pyramids, then you would, right. and you published a paper about it, you would be like, the, you'd be like the best archaeologist of all time. Like you, you know, you know, uh, if you were able to prove it, and people could not disprove you with peer review. Um, <laughs> right. You right. would be yeah. like one of the most successful archaeologists. They wouldn't. You wouldn't be hated and hounded you'd be like what i'm describing is uh actually like what kind of happened with einstein you know like he completely upended uh L newtonian fit like he was not just like it wasn't just like oh einstein shows up oh you know like of course he's right like no it was like he completely uh changed the way we think about physics and it's kind of what you're describing like um 
I don't know. Yeah, you know, you can say, oh, yeah, there's like a pyramid in Antarctica or whatever. Prove it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Obviously, like... if if you had like actual proof of that, then um, that would You'd be incredible. Win, yeah. Archaeologists yeah. would love that. Um, but you might win I a think... Nobel Prize. Like, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like... <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think here's my my stretch to try and work our way back towards things that we actually know something about. Um, but I, I see that happen a lot also in like pop culture or the arts or something like that, where like uh, people that consume the media um, are very confident in how they, they think something was made or how like the you know companies work or even right, just like, like the creative system. teams work you know it doesn't even have to be like a, a company or something it can it can even just be like i don't know oh like uh i'm trying to think of an example i i'm like, pretty sure i don't know, I know like the you beatles mean, or something like that like like in the beatles they're like oh well like paul's like this and john's like this so I'm right. listening to the song, and so like this thing must be John, and that thing must be Paul. Right. But like that's not really how things are made. A lot, right? Of the time. Yeah, and really, we don't know. Really, um, this is actually uh, I've talked about this in a in a podcast with uh, Dylan Snook. Um, this is like a like a topic of like endless fascination to me when it comes to like you know Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's collaboration, or like Stan Lee mm. and Jack Kirby. That like, mm -hmm. you know, we just don't know, you know, like we just don't know. I, I think we could be confident, like we can be confident that Stan Lee's version of events where he just came up with everything pretty much on his own. Like, that's probably not true, but like we, right. you know, <laughs> I think you can't say, oh, Steve Ditko came up with a hundred percent of everything also, you know, we, we don't, it's like, it's like you're saying it's some kind of crazy collaboration where uh we just yeah a lot don't of know. it's also just the sort of thing i mean like obviously no one would feel the necessity to litigate the specifics of like who came up with what for spider-man except that spider-man became <laughs> incredibly popular and uh you know financially um uh lucrative yeah <laughs> lucrative for anyone that's connected to it um, but yeah, it's a, it's a kind of thing where people are trying to pin down things that maybe can't really be pinned down. Yeah, uh, right. It's we, we, you know, we'll never know, right? You know, and it's uh, you know, it's like a really is something that like I've been obsessed with like since I was a kid, and I probably will be the rest of my life. Like we'll just never know, like how much of it was, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, like J. Jonah Jameson in spider-man like i think it's probably a fair bet to say you know i think jj is a little bit of a parody of stan lee so knowing that like we could probably assume stan lee did not want to parody himself right so you know what i mean you could kind of like pick out threads a little bit but you know um but right. i get what you're saying though that people online will be like you know, not necessarily about Spider-Man, but they'll speak about these kind of things. Like often writers just, you know, much like Stanley, like often writers get like a lot more credit maybe than they deserve in comic books when, you know, like, yeah. Um, when really like uh, I could imagine the point of view of an artist being like, okay, the writer just got credit for something that was pretty much like, you know, totally my creation on the page, like in this particular panel or whatever, like, um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, that, that even kind of relates to not just in, in something that's maybe even less concrete than like who did what in the creation of a piece of art, which I, you know, I was just saying that there are aspects of that that can't really be pinned down. At the same time, there are also components where, you know, there can be kind of concrete, like, okay, well, he did do this part of it, and this other guy did do this other part of it. Like, you know, there's some component of that. 
But one thing that is also fascinating to me is the um, the confidence that people will have in their like interpretation of a, a piece of artwork or a you know a novel or something like that where um, you'll see it every once in a while online where people will get into these big arguments about like what's the, like the metaphor of this movie like especially mm. for thing if it's a if it's a story that is not explicit in um i'm trying to think of like yeah i mean you know as you're talking like um you know something occurs to me that's probably a good example of that is like probably like a twin peaks is probably you know something that's highly highly symbolic and you know I, i'm not sure you can say one particular thing correlates to uh like representing something else like when you get into the world of like symbolism like right, right. symbolism like symbols are necessarily like abstracted like you know um if you have a word on a page technically letters and words are like forms of symbols but because but they're less abstracted so like if you have the you know if you have the word stop it's pretty much unambiguous what it means like it's written right there it says stop but then if you have like a stop sign well a stop sign still also has the word stop on it so it's still there's still a little bit of an element to that but let's say you just have like the red you know you just have the red octagon stop sign shape you don't have the word stop on it now it starts to be you know what i'm saying now it starts to be there's like uh, you know a little bit you know if you show that symbol to somebody in you know i don't know like malaysia like they may you know it's like uh a symbol is necessarily like abstracted and you know if, you know um maybe a stop sign is not the greatest example because that may be you know somewhat universal in its uh recognition across the world but um something like an apple you know what i mean like if i have an apple in a movie perhaps like you know there symbols contain necessarily sort of like an unconscious uh content to it uh, a word written on a page is a totally conscious on the surface thing like it's completely telling you what it is but like a symbol like for instance like i said in a movie if you had like an apple well, that could be like Eve's apple. That could be like, oh, perhaps it's meant to represent technology, like, you know, like Apple computer, you know, like sure. it could be, could be like temptation, you know, like, you know, it could be like, uh, you know, forbidden fruit. Um, you know, it's, you, you know, it's uh, to ascribe one meaning to it specifically, um, you know, if they wanted one meaning to be as, you know, ascribed to it, they'd just tell you what that was and they'd be explicit about it. So I don't know. I, right. I There's think... a, an apple kind of contains uh because it is involved in these sort of like famous stories in a variety of ways. Um right. Yeah. I mean it's it has like it, unconscious it, it, it content. There, you know, like... Yeah, there are there are a variety of things that it could mean in isolation but then depending on how a storyteller is using that you know it could be a reference to or it could be you know recalling snow white or it exactly. could be recalling uh you know a gift for your teacher <laughs> yeah i mean um, it's context dependent you know like could be like the apple of my eye you know like it's you know, if, if, if the, you know, it's context dependent, like if the apple was rotting and there was a worm sticking out of it, like, okay, that may, that, you know, I think it's clear that maybe has a different, you know, unconscious, you know, symbolic meaning than, you know, like the apple in the garden of Eden or, or whatever, um, you right. know, so something that I think is kind of like, you know, something like Twin Peaks, like I said, is probably prone to people being like, oh, if this represented that. Like, well, we don't, you know, we don't really know. I mean, it's open to interpretation. I mean, that's the nature of symbolic material. Well, and I think Twin Peaks is the a 
kind of story that um, is inviting uh, maybe not even necessarily interpretation, but it's uh, it's combining a lot of different um, imagery and ideas in a way that it's, you know, not expecting you to, it's not expecting the audience to have one definitive kind of understanding of what is happening necessarily. Right, yeah. There's a broader range of maybe what it could be. Alternately, there's there are stories that are pretty simple and pretty concrete, but because they're kind of very potent, even if maybe the people that are telling that story are saying like, you know, the shark is just a shark or whatever in Jaws. Right. There are still lots of people that are inclined to uh, make it into a metaphor when it doesn't necessarily have to be. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would even but it's also because say... Of, but it's Sorry. because of the qualities that we're, you're kind of talking about with the Apple, that there is this, like, it's not just, like, a scary movie because sharks are scary. There are, there are certain more specific types of fear or types of ideas that are kind of attached to what a, a shark, you know, it's, it's a a force of nature and it's like a all consuming kind of <laughs> uh, right. hunger thing, you know, so that people can maybe uh, improperly insist that because it has those qualities, it is a metaphor for something that also has those qualities, but there are all kinds of things that also have those qualities. So it's like, Yeah, I mean, I this is maybe sort this of is interesting to me. This is interesting to me because uh, uh, I will I will say, like, I have no problem with, like, you know, in the example of Jaws, I have no problem with, like, people having, like, a uh, wide variety of interpretations. Like, you know, you were kind of hitting on some interesting ones right there, like an endless hunger, like, um, you know, like a, a shark is also an interesting thing for what we're talking about with, like, this kind of symbolic unconscious content because like it literally comes up from the depths like you know the mysterious like dark depths and it kind of bubbles up you know and it's like it's like you know i think you could make like if I, you know i'm like an english major like you know in college so like i think you could write like a paper making a strong argument for these kinds of things that we're talking about that like, Oh, it comes up from the depths, you know, it's like, it's like subconscious problems, like rising to the surface and, you know, tearing you apart and consuming you. Like, I think you could make a good argument for that, but I hear what you're saying that like, yeah, except that Steven Spielberg says, no, it's just a fucking shark, you know? And I think there's an element that um, Spielberg doesn't totally own and not just Spielberg, but everybody like, you know, when you make something like you don't totally uh, own it in a way like it kind of, you know, you own it. Yes. In the technical sense of like legally owning it or whatever, at least until copyright expires or, you know, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, until whatever the fucking copyright law is now 75 years plus, you know, after your death or something like that. But um, you don't own it in the sense that like it becomes a part of the like world it becomes a part of like uh like public imagination like you know just off the top of my head like i'm obsessed with dune right now and like the you know the, you know i loved dune part two um i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure that frank herbert pronounced like the fremen i'm pretty sure he now pronounced it freeman you know but we all call it we all call it Fremen. We all agree that's correct. But that's not what he thought. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not saying, oh, Frank Herbert is correct and we should all call it Freeman. I think we should call it Fremen because we all you see what I'm saying? Like it doesn't yeah, it yeah. doesn't a hundred percent belong to him, sort like once it reaches a certain threshold of like entering the public imagination, it kind of I don't know. Like I, I would even throw out something like Game of Thrones as being in a similar territory that like you sort of it becomes a part of like mythology almost and you know you kind of yeah i don't know well, I think, um yeah so there's that side of it where like jaws is so popular that 
someone who has never heard of Jaws or has never seen Jaws, but maybe has never even heard of it, knows things about Jaws. <laughs> um, and maybe those things aren't even correct. Like it's so kind of a part of the culture. It's so far outside of Steven Spielberg's control um, that, you know, there's like a kid on a playground right now that is like sneaking, sneaking up on one of his right. friends, making like the John Williams music. doing the John Williams score. Doesn't know anything. Doesn't know it's from Jaws. Doesn't you know? No context. Right. Out. He saw but, it on Family Guy or something. Right, right, right. Um, so there's that side of it, but then there's also the side of it where um, maybe Spielberg didn't maybe he wasn't specifically thinking about like whatever the kind of like right. metaphysical qualities of a shark or something like that. Listen, or, like, but you know, we're, we're getting into things, shark. but I think one of the things that is good or at least comforting to me as a moron is that like you can create something and it can be more sophisticated and more insightful about the world and more resonant for other people than you are actually like yourself um right yeah like no i mean i i think we're getting into really interesting stuff here because um you know i kind of have like a personal like philosophy that like i don't think that we have like total conscious control over like the things that we write and create you know like what, what i mean by that is like Steven Spielberg may not have consciously been like, oh, you know, the shark represents like, you know, uh, like you were saying, like insatiable, like, you know, mad, you know, murderous hunger coming up from the depths of our like, you know, uh, unconscious, like bestial mind, you know, like, you know, he may not have been thinking that consciously. But like Steven Spielberg has a subconscious too. You know what I'm saying? Like he's, you know, right. and by the way, we should throw in about all this that like, I'm pretty sure Jaws is based on a book, so I think right, right. You know, another layer of uh, yeah. Of, I think there there is yeah. an element that he's not even really create, and I I don't know. Like I'm not the biggest expert about Jaws. Like I me, me have my doubts. Yeah. <laughs> I have my doubts that Steven Spielberg even wrote it. Like he probably didn't. You know, wrote the movie. I mean, right. Um, but for I mean, also just for something like Jaws obviously the writing is a component of it but i don't necessarily i i would maybe i would uh, it's most argue visual. potentially that the writing is not the biggest component of why jaws is like compelling it and right you know resonant right. for an audience for as long right. as because it, it could have been adapted in any number of ways like the you know the important thing is the way that it was adapted visually on the on the screen is what is what made it so resonant um by the way i am seeing here I guess the screenplay was written. I have no idea who these people are, but Peter Benchley and Carl Gottlieb. So, you know, right. you know, they, uh, I guess Peter Benchley wrote the book, but I, I feel like such a, like a jerk because it's like, Oh yeah, you don't know who they are. They only, they only wrote the screenplay for one of the, <laughs> the biggest and most successful, you know, beloved movies of all time, you know, like, you know. Uh, right. I mean, especially for, I mean, when we're, it's different when it's comics where it's, there's, even in a big team on a comic, you know, the it's pretty often easy to is... kind of spot who's doing what. On something like a movie, you know, it's it's kind of it's you know exponentially more uh, ephemeral as far as like who's responsible for what and, right. and on the <laughs> day, how, how something on, like you that. know, it's like. It's like, I'm sure, you know, there's plenty of shots. Like I, it's been a long time since I've seen Jaws, but just on the off the top of my head, there's plenty of shots where it's like, oh, the shark is under the water. He sees the the woman's legs like from below. You know, I, I it probably doesn't say that in the screenplay. And even if it does, it, even if it does say that, like shooting it is completely different from just writing those words uh, in a screenplay. It, it kind of brings me back to comic books a little bit, like, you know, writing a comic script is like, I could tell you, okay, show me this superhero, like flying through multiple dimensions. And that's very easy for me to say, you know, but how are you right. actually going to execute that on the page? Like in, yeah. Um, well, I, yeah. I mean, there's so many things where, 
this kind of reminds me of um, the first issue of Black Hammer Reborn that Matt and I drew. You know, we're, we're coming into the, uh, Caitlin Yarsky had already drawn like the first uh, maybe four issues of that story, like that particular story, not just Black mm -hmm. Hammer in general, but like we're coming on after like a huge thing has just happened to the main character, like this huge traumatic event happened at the end of the issue before our issue. Mm -hmm. And so Matt and I are thinking about, you know, the script is like, uh, Lucy, the main character, you know, like, um, is like, I don't know, just processing what just happened or she's like in despair, basically. Hmm. Um, she's in her house, she's despairing and that's kind of it. Um, and so Matt and I are, are trying to brainstorm like how do we communicate the devastation of this in a way that feels tangible, you know, because it's so easy to say, so, you know, you want it to feel real, like you want, it to, you want the, reader to <laughs> identify it has to, it has to read yeah. on the page it has to be conveyed visually and it was just conveyed to you in words and this kind of goes back to what i was saying about you know um words are very explicit like it's telling you uh like what it is but now okay when you have to portray something visually that is no longer like you know uh how do you portray visually like distraught or in despair? You know, um, right. it's, it's not as, it's, it's more, in, uh, it's not as unambiguous as if I just tell you Lucy was distraught, you understand immediately, but if you have to depict it visually, is she crying? Does she have her head in her hands? <laughs> is she what? in the fetal position on the floor? You know, it's, there's a range of ways that that could be visually. Depicted. Right. And even if you do have maybe a more specific description of like what she's physically doing, it is also just a, a, a matter of like, yeah, we can, it, you can communicate it so that the reader understands what she's mm -hmm. feeling, but ideally you would communicate it so that the reader uh, feels is it having like an emotional connection to yes. what is occurring. And so in that, in that endeavor, we're trying to think of like, okay, may, the, what are some like formal ways that we can kind of represent the feeling of kind of shocking trauma, like the aftermath of something like that. And so we're thinking of all these ideas of like, oh, we could kind of like take multiple, like draw her sitting on this couch, kind of not knowing what to do. And then like taking that original line work and kind of layering it on top of itself a few times and rotating the image so that it's sort of vibrating, you know, so trying to think of ways wow. to get to that feeling. Anyway, we go, we brainstorm a bunch of different kind of formal tricks to try and figure out how to do that. And then Matt goes off and draws the pencils, like does the drawing for it. And he sent me the drawing to, you know, like ink it. And um, it just turns out that the drawing was fucking incredible. Huh. And we didn't have to do any of that formal stuff because huh. the pencils just portrayed the specifics and kind of the multiple kind of layers of sensation and all the kind of nuance and, and hopelessness and stuff like that that we wanted to be in there was just in there in the body language that Matt figured out how to, you know, perform in this drawing and the facial expression and the specifics of like how the kind of the room is trashed and all that kind of stuff. So in the end, we didn't even really need any of that formal stuff that we were brainstorming because like the drawing just did it on its own. So it, particularly in comics, there's there's sort of all of these different kinds of tools and you, you're always kind of looking for like the right balance or like which one of these things is going to be the thing that 
delivers the punch <laughs> um, in this particular moment. And you, you kind of just have to figure it out. Like you never really know. Sometimes it's just a line of dialogue and the drawing doesn't even matter. And then other times, you know, it's just the drawing and nothing else. This is a really like, you know, fascinating look into your your process here not to not to pat myself on the back like you know i have a good podcast but uh you know like <laughs> i'm just saying this is really like interesting um just, this is just a shot in the dark here but i happen to be just like uh like looking through google images of, of this as you're talking is it the page where she kind of like slams a hammer onto the couch or you know what i'm saying or uh no that's kind of like the moment right after that okay uh, okay yeah, it's tough so because like, I'm just like, I'm just seeing, uh, I'm not necessarily getting like a full look at the whole comic. I'm getting little pages in the right. Google preview, but oh, right. when she was on the couch, she was sitting on the couch. Yes. Yeah. 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 I see what you mean now. And She's we like, still did like, we still ended up kind of incorporating this idea that kind of when you're experiencing that sort of shock that there's like a weird kind of like, timelessness like like or a, even that right. like reality feels broken a little bit and so the, we did end up doing a little bit where like um there's a little strip at the top and a little strip i at the see bottom that that's very interesting yeah that are I kind of that. Like indicating that uh there are other moments in time kind of right it's like dislocated a little bit yeah like almost like if like a I don't know, like a film strip has come right off of the like reel and you see a little bit of the frames before and after. It's a little huh. bit of that, but hopefully it's like not very intrusive. So it's it's just sort of contributing to the overall feeling and not getting in the way of the drawing. Um, because yeah, like I said, initially we had kind of planned for much more sort of formally like attention grabbing ways to kind of communicate that um but yeah in the it's, end it's it... interesting um as as you were talking it kind of reminds me of um you know uh there's this you know when you talk about in you know over interpreting things and kind of ascribing meaning that is perhaps not there uh you know this maybe is my own personal example of that but uh there's this line in the in the first season of uh true detective where, you know, uh, the Matthew McConaughey character says, uh, oh, yeah, you know, I've always taken a lot of notes. Like, the thing is, like, you you never know what the thing is going to be. And, and I have always kind of like my own little kind of, you know, uh, mini conspiracy theory about that, that that's like almost like a meta commentary on like writing, you know, that's like, mm. like, like you're talking about with Matt, like you come up with a million ideas and you have a million notes and it's not necessarily that you're going to use every single idea that you come up with, but you just don't, you don't know what the thing is going to be. So, you know what I mean? Like you come up with a hundred ideas and five of them end up into the actual thing that that's sort of more how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why, a piece of artwork can be kind of uh, smarter and more insightful than the person that makes it. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm stealing, I'm paraphrasing, I think from, um, I think it's from the George Saunders book about writing. I, I think that's, this is where this idea is from, but basically the idea is like, even when it's only one person working on something, if you're, if you have an idea and you have an idea on Monday and then you kind of mull over that idea over the course of a week and then you write it down and then you come back to it a few days later and you maybe do a little edit on that idea and then you, you whatever. And you're a different the, person a couple of days later. You, you like have some conversation with someone and then that makes you think of something and then you kind of modify the thing so that it is reactive to that thing that happened to you. If you're a comics person, you're adding and drawing to that, then, you know, like mm. 
maybe collecting reference one day and then you see, you know, you add something in, you add something in again later. Right. And maybe you just happen to see something on like, maybe you happen to see something just on Twitter that, oh, you just saw an image that's like, oh, that's a perfect reference for, for what I'm trying to do here. You know? Right. So one of the reasons that it can be greater than you is because it's not just you. It's like, 20 different versions of you spread right. across the entirety of, you know, the act of making this thing that all have kind of maybe even just minutely different perspectives <laughs> on uh, the work and, or your own life or, you know, what the world is or anything like that. And sometimes it can be very different perspectives uh depending on what has happened to you while you're working on no it. yeah definitely um, i mean you know so I, I i agree with everything that you're saying like pretty much 100 percent. i mean you could be a different person you know you know three weeks later than than you were when you started working on the thing and there there's a process of uh there's a process of like emergence with this stuff that you know it's like I, going back to what i said before like i don't think that I don't think that we have total conscious control over the end result of what like a, like a piece of writing or like a, like a comic book or like a piece of art ends up being like, we have sort of ideas of what we want to be, want, want it to be, but like, you know, where do the ideas come from? Like, they're not, you know, there's, there's a part of our brain that like, you know, is not necessary. You know, I think like our conscious mind is just like a teeny tiny little boat on the t on the top of an ocean you know we don't know <laughs> you know what i'm saying stuff comes bubbling up and it's like where did that idea come from like you know like yeah and i, and I think you don't even have to necessarily before you even get to ideas about like unconscious mind even just even just the fact that you're never really going to be like totally aware of yourself in in a just in a conscious sense uh, uh in terms of like like you may not remember like going through emotionally came up with or one. What's, kind of, what's kind of bugging you or something like i feel like a lot of artists have had and i've had this experience where they look back at stuff that they made years ago and realize like oh man i was obsessed with fill in the blanks right now you don't clearly i was thinking about this thing this idea a lot and at the time, it wasn't something that you were necessarily like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do like a comic about this. Um, but then like, yeah, five years later, like, obviously, this book is about <laughs> this thing that was I was going through at that time. You know, uh -huh. so sometimes, you know, I'll watch Jaws and I'll be like, I think Steven Spielberg is a shark. <laughs> uh, sometimes you, sometimes it's maybe really more personal than you kind of realize. Um, I, you know, I forget what this was, but uh, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to find it as I'm talking to you. But there was this interview with Steven Spielberg where I, I think it probably was about like Jurassic Park or something where the interviewer hit him with some sort of question where he was like, do you think like maybe like your, oh, I, you know what I think it was? He was like, a lot of your movies revolve around like a family, you know, you know, in Jurassic Park, the example of that would be like, you know, the two uh, paleontologists are like taking care of these like little kids that are like stranded in the park. And, you know, over the course right. of the movie, then, you know, the doc at the beginning of the movie, the the Alan Grant, the Dr. Alan Grant character hates kids and he famously terrorizes that one kid in the first five minutes or whatever with like <laughs> right. the velociraptor speech and claw. And then by the end of the movie, he like is like basically loves kids and is more open to it. He's gone through like sort of a transformative experience. And I think in this interview, they were saying like, like the interviewer kind of got Steven Spielberg a little bit where he was saying like, do you think like, you know, your movies kind of revolve around like a family in peril. Do you think any of that has to do with like your own like family? And it's like, so it's like you sort of mm -hmm. working that out a little bit. And it was a very fascinating moment because like Steven Spielberg was literally like, you know, I, he literally was like, I never thought of that before, but I, you're, <laughs> you're honestly blowing my mind. Like, I think that is true. Like he, he wasn't being sarcastic or like, you know, yeah, being snide or anything. 
I think I know the interview you're talking about. I think it was a, it might even have been in reference to, maybe this is a different one, Close Encounters. Because yeah, like, I think you're right. I think possibly the right. interviewer was talking about like his mom, Spielberg's mom was a musician and his dad was like a engineer or, you know, kind of like a. Right. It was like how the father <laughs> was so obsessed with uh, the mountain thing, like carving the potato mountain. Well, and that, and that like, um, that basically like the aliens at the end of Close Encounters have this kind of synthesis of like uh math and music hmm. uh, that, that they're sort of you know that this like uh, basically like religious transcendent experience that uh Richard Dreyfus has at the at the end of the movie with these aliens is kind of like a in some ways like a reconciliation with of Spielberg to his parents or like a hope of kind of the connection that he wants to have with his parents or something. I I th I think that that was kind of what the interview was about. And Spielberg was kind of like, you know, agreed, but was kind of taken aback or whatever. And You're I don't right. know. That, like, like, it seemed like they kind of like, not in a negative way, but they seemed like they kind of got him in that moment a little bit. Or he had a bit of like a little bit of like a, like a spark in his brain or he was like, you know, um, I'm trying to find it, but I don't even think I'm going to be able to. But <laughs> it seems like you, yeah, it seems like you know what I'm talking about, but. I recently, this, I mean, this is probably why I keep bringing up Jaws and Spielberg and stuff like that. I recently watched all of the, all of Spielberg's movies, like. All of them? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I started, like I started. Oh with my God. All the theatrical ones. I started with Drive and I went through and watched all of them in order all the way up to Fableman's um wow and that i apologies for um you know being no insane. that's awesome i mean now <laughs> i feel like you know you gotta start your own podcast called like you know the spiel cast <laughs> or something i mean that's like amazing like how many that's like 100 movies right or it's gotta be it's gotta no, be... No, no. i think it was like 36 oh 34. is oh, that that's like... really the total yeah. amount that he's done yeah i'm sure i'm surprised by that i would have thought it'd be like at least 50 um what about uh so that includes um the terminal yeah <laughs> yeah Does i want include the terminal okay yeah. what about uh, what about hook was that one i got hook yeah i watched hook. <laughs> the, that's uh, like the it's... ones there were like a couple of tv movies that he did kind of right at the beginning of his career that I oh interesting watch. yeah no i would, I would else... excuse you from that i don't think you have to do that everything else i i watched though yeah just and out I'm of curiosity, how, like, how does the terminal hold up? Is that is that good? It's awful. <laughs> uh, I remember liking it at the time, but I was probably like 15 or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I remember liking it also, and uh it's it's right near the bottom of huh. <laughs> for me personally. I I mean there's definitely like any one of the reasons it was me and some friends that all agreed to do this because I'm not even necessarily like a huge Spielberg guy um but there is kind of like a baseline level of like the movies being entertaining and interesting so like even the there's only really like a couple that i was like man this is tough to finish <laughs> i would uh, say i'm gonna guess what they are bridge of spies is probably <laughs> that's that's gotta be one right uh what is it uh what did he do the post is that is that what it was the post is one of his yeah uh, how, how would you think of that one i actually liked both of those oh okay all he has, right he has this phase where he does kind of like i call them like paperwork procedurals huh. so like it's just like a lot of talk it's like very dialogue driven and you know there's some kind of you know it's usually they're historical also like Lincoln is basically like this as well. Right. But I'm kind of a sucker for that kind of stuff. They're usually like pretty dry. I always want them to be like drier. <laughs> huh. um, but all of those I thought were like pretty entertaining, but definitely forgettable. Like, you know, the right. post, it yeah. I like ever forgot about the post. The ones, the ones that I thought were the worst were like, um, war horse 
All right, one. yeah, I don't, I haven't even seen that one. Okay, yeah, that's, that's gotta be pretty bad, favorite. I imagine. And then he did. Uh, there was a uh, uh, Ready Player One was really bad. Oh yeah, I didn't even. Yeah, I guess I even forgot that. That's that's such a mishmash of like pop cultural references. I completely blacked out that it was Spielberg. And that one doesn't. Yeah, that one really doesn't feel like Spielberg at all. Probably more so than anything he's done because huh. whenever he starts. Because so much of that movie is like in the like, it's so it's CGI like, heavy. CGI, yeah, and like, this is so uh, whatever. Uh, it's too late now. We already talked about Fauci <laughs> yeah, yeah, for twenty here. minutes. We're here. So it's we're too here. late. Um, so I was reading this interview with him, and he was talking about like a lot of the time he does not plan stuff out. Like huh. he'll go in early on the day and figure out the blocking that day and like huh. how the camera is going to move. And I, my personal theory is that that is like an essential part of his process. And when he doesn't do that consistently, it's because it's these it's like CGI heavy things where stuff has to be uh, figured out beforehand um, because of just all the technical hmm. elements that are at play. Uh, so yeah, most of Ready Player One is CG or, you know, predominantly mm -hmm. CG and, and the, the camera work is just not like to me that the way the camera moves and the blocking is kind of like the signature of Spielberg and, and like right. the kind of the thing that he's like a genius at, like no one does it the way that he does it um i heard you know that i, I was like listening it, to something i was listening to something recently i'm not sure who said this like i, I want to say that it was like matt damon or something but then on the other hand what oh uh what is that guy's name who's an uh oh brother where art thou fucking uh george clooney no no and tim blake nelson i'm pretty sure it was tim oh, blake oh, nelson yeah. He yeah. was saying like in a, in a, like a podcast interview. So I'm basically just on my, my own podcast. I'm just recounting another podcast, but <laughs> he, he was saying like, he was like, he was saying working with Spielberg, like he was pretty sure that Spielberg, I guess he worked with him on Lincoln. He was saying like, he was pretty sure Spielberg could do pretty much every job associated with making a movie. Like he could do everything <laughs> like, you know what I right. mean? He's he's not just a guy sitting behind like a bank of uh of video screens. Like he could he could be the camera. Like he was he was describing how they had a thing where Spielberg was literally operating the camera himself. Like you know he was he was being he was acting as a cameraman basically. And he was saying like he was saying like Spielberg's depth of knowledge about filmmaking is just like insane. And uh, I don't know. You know I mean. Uh, what can I say? I mean, you know, uh, he made hook. I mean, no, I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually, I actually like, I think probably in the last six months, like I, I rewatched hook. I actually think, why was that not? That was, I, I actually kind of like hook. Like, you know, I kind of feel like that's, that's one a good that, movie. Like it's one that, um, like, I guess probably millennials maybe, yeah i think that's true i think there it it wasn't big for we me all love when it. i was a kid <laughs> what's that yeah like when i was a kid uh i was not like a big hook person like i probably watched it like once or something like that i mean um you know so i don't have that like hardcore like millennial nostalgia mm -hmm. for it but i think you're right that i think there is like i think there is a millennial nostalgia for that movie for sure yeah big time i think anyone that's older is like oh yeah hooks terrible um but then anyone kind of in our basic age range thinks it's incredible yeah but um, i mean be like listen i'm an i'm an adult i watched it recently like i don't have like a childhood attachment to it i watched right. it purely with adult eyes and i was like this is a fucking good movie i mean i don't know <laughs> it, you yeah. know it, it touched it touched me i i honestly felt uh um Dustin Hoffman, I felt was like unrecognizable as like the titular hook. Like it was like, right. you know, he was like incredible. Like it's, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm now just ranting and raving about 
how good <laughs> Hook about. is. Like a largely <laughs> uh, loathed movie. I'm just saying is good, but um, man, should yeah. we get back to comics? I mean, I feel bad. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, this well, is fascinating barely... stuff, but yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I if I have another uh, segue, tenuous segue, the way I did before. Uh, well, I'm just gonna like <laughs> aggressively shift gears so hard it's just completely destroying the yeah, yeah the podcast car. But um yeah, I mean I just I mean I guess just uh getting back to like Black Hammer a little bit, which we first we started with a little bit. Um, you know, I'll just admit to you, like I'm not like you know, like I was saying, the Black Hammer universe is fairly extensive at this point, where there's something like uh uh close i think there's something like 15 different mini series or, or maybe even more than that um so you know i'm not like uh the world's biggest expert about it but uh just looking at like some pages from like black hammer the end um i got a big uh i got a big like like this is like uh jeff lemire and and you you're doing like a almost like a your own crisis here you know like it's uh sort of yeah. a multiversal uh end of the universe type thing where people from across the i guess you you guys call it like the paraverse people from across the paraverse are like teaming up to defeat like uh anti-god who uh again correct me if i'm wrong about any of this because i'm not like the uh expert about it but um like anti-god to my eye kind of appears to be sort of like dark side-esque right or yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the, I mean, this, finale, like, like when I signed on to do, um, to do this last run, uh, Jeff sent me a bunch of, like, yeah, copies of, like, Christ's Son, Infinite Earths. And, oh, um, interesting. Uh, and I think that that's been, that's not even just for uh, this last kind of run of stories. I think that that has been a part of the inspiration since the beginning when he was doing it with uh, with Dean Ormston when they co-created it, because mm -hmm. kind of the initial sort of premise, if you if no one's ever read Black Hammer before, the way it kind of starts off is like... Like the yeah, bad guy this, won. Well, not, not even quite that. Like oh, okay. the, the superhero team of kind of maybe golden age type superheroes um fights this uh you know anti-god um and they defeat him but it's almost like it's a there's a kind of a meta quality to it where basically these characters have been kind of like retconned out of the new because you know one of the things with like uh crisis on infinite earth is that it was done to kind of consolidate uh the complex like dozens well, of like alternate earths into one yeah yeah and to kind of like freshen the lineup and uh kind of streamline it and uh into uh, one universe modify everything so that it's like friendly to new readers so basically the premise of black hammer is that it's this team of superheroes that they beat the bad guy but now they live in this kind of like purgatorial pocket universe that's just this farm hmm. um and they're just kind of stuck out on this farm living like normal people um and so it's much more like um it's not really like focused even though it's superhero characters it's not really focused on like super heroics necessarily it's much more of like a character driven story about like yeah these characters that have, how do you deal have, with the aftermath of yeah push, winning push but out. also losing yeah and and they're kind of like you know forcefully retired and separated right. from everything that they know um and so obviously like because there's there's so many different stories and the world is so big like it's gone on and expanded um to cover a lot of different characters uh over the years but yeah for this final story because it really is there will be more stories set in this universe but as far as like the mainline narrative 
this really is the end of that story. Yeah, so, I mean that's that's one of the things I was wondering about is uh the you know the little bit of research I did about it was saying like the way it was kind of billed was like a lot of mysteries will be wrapped up, but like a lot of there will be a lot of conclusions. And you know, listen, I'm not trying to get you on like I get it if you can't reveal anything. I'm not, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not trying to get you on like a gotcha question or something, but I don't know. Maybe that's something so there is gonna be more after this you think or you know again if you can't say you know oh no, no. don't say I'm you know what i mean understanding i mean obviously it's jeff's thing so like who knows you know what he'll decide to do in the future but my right. understanding is that basically like there will there will continue to be more um of the mini series that are basically like standalone stories that are set hmm. in the same universe but aren't ne- but aren't really like following the or you know following that main kind of narrative thread that started right. with the black hammer title so i think that's kind of how you think is. like he's he's pretty much done with black hammer in terms of like the main line main arc of the story but he's still going to do stuff that's sort of like adjacent to that universe he's still going to do stuff within that universe but just sort of the the main the main thing this is the conclusion of it would that yeah. be like kind yeah. of accurate yeah yeah it's yeah so it so yeah, I guess- uh, it's kind of incredible i mean looking through images and stuff i mean just obviously obviously i think your work is amazing but i just mean that it's, it's, it's incredible um what he's done in terms of like you know this is like literally how many years now uh you know since 2016 i mean uh easily eight years yeah. of like spinoff not i don't like i keep saying spinoff i don't think that's the correct word like you know mini series within this universe culminating and now like he's doing like his big you know uh crossover event but it's crossing over with nothing you know it's crossing over <laughs> with himself um right right um and one thing i you know one thing i just wanted to throw out here i'm not even really sure you know what you could i'm not sure like what there is to say about this but i did notice that i guess there was a black hammer justice league uh team up sort of thing or you know and that that's that's you know that's a fairly incredible uh achievement i think to you know he pierced through uh to get you know his own sort of uh you know justice league slash you know not necessarily just justice league but justice league slash superhero team inspired thing actually pierced through to like now it's interacting with the actual justice league you know yeah that i mean that is incredibly rare (laughs) um for uh you know like marvel or dc to uh allow their right their ip interact with (laughs) with right it's got to be a short list it's got to be like oh teenage mutant ninja turtles team up with I don't even know if they have for I don't even know if that's if they have, but it's gotta be a short list, like you know, Hellboy and Batman, I imagine maybe it was possibly a thing, or I'm I'm literally you know, I, I don't, don't know. There know was if there's I'm like correct, a Batman but... and um Batman Predator, Batman Alien. There right, yeah, a... yeah. Definitely those yeah. definitely pop into mind. Um, um and then you know, sort of famously in the nineties, um, there was the there was like a marvel deep marvel versus the thing right but But this is a this is a different sort of thing where it's like you know we keep we keep going back to this but uh you know it's i it's sort of like an indie superhero universe i'm not sure indie is the is the perfect word for it because companies like dark horse and image like they're sort of mainstream in their own way but uh it's yeah. definitely an independently owned superhero universe by this by you know by jeff lemire and it's you know, it's uh, I don't know. It's just sort of an incredible accomplishment to then now it's like now you're fucking talking to Superman, you know, like now <laughs> the characters you created are interacting with Batman, like, you know. Oh. Um, yeah. And I think. Even if it's maybe doesn't fit like a commercial definition of indie, I think tonally it is like a good description of it, like an indie superhero universe, because yeah. I like Jeff also kind of has that 
a similar kind of, I mean, obviously he's incredibly successful, so it's not, it's different in a lot of ways, but. Right. Yeah. It's similar, where he, he yeah, I he mean, keeps that aesthetic though. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it has that, like his, his writing has that particularly in black hammer where uh like i was saying very character driven very like you know he's free to kind of make it as melancholy and kind of um uh outside the bounds of what you would usually read in a uh mainstream superhero book where there has to be like an action scene every 10 pages or something like that. And especially, you know, with with Dean Ormston who co-created it, like Dean kind of, his favorite kind of stuff to draw is more like horror comics. And so like the aesthetic that he established for the series is much more kind of like Gothic and like, uh, um, like art deco in, influenced uh and and classic horror comics influenced so uh it's superheroes but it has yeah it has a lot of other um genres and and artistic uh lineages kind of like infused together into it that makes it um a little bit different but you were talking about like things that it's kind of similar to in terms of format and Hellboy is actually like a good comparison where it's like kind of tonally similar to Hellboy, but it's more mm. for hero version. And Hellboy also does that thing where there's kind of, there's the main storyline, but then there's also. Right. They have series. like an Abe Sapien series, you know, you know yeah, yeah. probably like yeah. BRPD. Right. Right. Yeah. So in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of uh, in, in that tradition, I, I would say. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so, so how do you, so now you're done like with your work on like black hammer, uh, the end and like, you know, how do you feel about that? Like that probably was it, you know, I'm going to just going to guess off the top of my head, like a year and a half or more, or just like drawing pages for this. And, uh, well, you know, all together the black hammer stuff. So like, not just, not the, just the end, but the um, other stuff but, you worked on. Yeah, all the other stuff too. Um, it's been like three years. Uh, and part of that is because I wasn't drawing very fast because I also had a day job, <laughs> um, like a full-time day job. So, it, you know, it's tough to draw like a monthly comic. Definitely, uh, yeah. It's yeah. tough just with no day job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh but it has been because like the stuff that Matt and I have done in the past, even though it was coming out in that like direct market kind of, you know, landscape of, of uh, the comic book world, this was the, like this black hammer stuff was the first time where it was like either on my own for the art or uh, with Matt where we were kind of, to me, it felt like we were stepping into the like, in my mind, kind of like romanticized um, tradition of like the monthly superhero. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm looking know. at pictures of it. It's it's very much like it's uh, it's like I'm looking at like an alternate universe of you know. Maybe that's not the best way to put it because I feel like it's almost diminishing it, but it's like it's like I'm looking at this could this is like an alternate superhero universe, sort of, you know? Um yeah. That's yeah. sort of why I was saying at the at the start of the of the of the episode, um, man, you know, uh if I'm Netflix, it's like this is my, you know, make a fucking two hundred million dollar, you know, whatever Netflix movie of this, like or T or series, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. This is your potential Avengers property here, but that's again when you use these kind of terms, like you know, listen, like I like the Avengers movies as much as as the next guy, but it's sort of a little bit like you know, like McDonald's. You know what I mean? Like, like a McDonald's hamburger is fine, and I like it, and it's even really good. But like, you know, come on, like you know, you know what I'm saying? Like what you guys <laughs> right. are doing is not McDonald's. Like it's a little bit diminishing to even make that comparison, but. Um, 
Right. It would be more, I mean, it's not anything like, it's not anything like the boys that the. Uh, right. It's not like, um, but it's not in subverting product, and it's not a satire. It's not a satire, but it is, it, it could definitely, it's more of a deconstruction than it right. is a like straight up superhero story for right, sure. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, uh, it was like very challenging to work on it, but, um, it was like, it did feel really good. Even, even just on like a basic level of like, okay, I, I was able to do that. <laughs> yeah, know? no, like, I mean, it's a huge uh, achievement. It's a huge uh, achievement. I mean, how many pages were these per issue? Like, so how, you know, times six issues, like how much were you in it for? Like how many pages total? Uh, the, for the end one, I think they were usually, they ended up varying because we kind of moved some stuff around. So like we took some pages from like the third issue and, and, and put them into the first issue. So oh, like the first issue is a little long, like first issue is maybe like 24 pages. And then like most of the time they're 22, the last issue is like 36 um uh yeah so you know well, probably I mean, like 150 or more pages right yeah for the end yeah yeah uh yeah i think like 160 or something like that so that's a huge there. amount of pages and like you know how, you know how long you know work you're working on it for like a year right i mean that's a huge amount of pages yeah yeah, yeah. So do you feel like, yeah, uh, it's fun. And I, you know, sorry, I have Hello? a new appreciation for the, for the, uh, that really like grind away and do like a page every single day <laughs> right, <laughs> and like yeah, keep man. a really like monthly schedule and stuff like that. Like, that's, like you feel like, like yeah. a touch, like burned out at all, or, you know what I mean? Like, are you, you know what I'm saying? Are you going to take a break from that kind of work? for a little while or are you already moving on to the next thing uh i am i am taking a break or i you know have taken a break um and i did get there there was a particular time i think it was still during the reborn where i definitely did burn out um mm -hmm. because partially oh, because reborn was already like on like the train was already on the tracks and it was already moving. So like stuff just had to get done at a certain time. Whereas like the end, uh, we, you know, had more control over like, okay, well, you know, we'll, it'll start releasing when there's, there's, you know. Interesting. You built up enough of a runway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was a combo of that during some of Reborn and then also like, the day job stuff I do is like uh, animation and just the particular show that I was on at that time um, was just a lot harder show than usual. Um, so it was just kind of a a combo of, <laughs> of those two things. Right. Yeah. I mean, we haven't and, talked and like, about this at all, but like, didn't you do like, you did like background design for like Centaur World and uh, Captain Fall and Exploding Kittens? Like, is, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, and so and I I really like doing that, like the uh doing the like drawing backgrounds for cartoon shows. Um uh but you know, when you're doing that and um and you're kind of like on a deadline for like a comic book. <laughs> um and it you know, it's just one of those things that it happens with freelancers a lot where it's just like all of a sudden you're getting a lot of opportunities all at once. And um, some of them are hard to say. Like, like I, I don't know that I can ever say no to like a Star Trek. <laughs> really. Right. Yeah. Maybe we should talk a little bit about yeah. that. Uh, you know, are you like a big Star Trek guy? Like, you know, like prior to yeah. working on it? Yeah. And yeah, Star Trek's kind of the only thing where i'm like i'm That's like a dream a, property full-on like fool for it you know like <laughs> like uh, 
like a true, you know, fan. Um, so have you, uh, you've seen other like, stuff. what's that? Have you seen like all the series? You know, have you seen like the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space yeah. Nine? Like, you have you seen yeah. everything? Yeah, I've no, I've seen every minute of Star Trek. Like even 10. Enterprise. But, I love Enterprise. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've seen everything. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, even though I, like, at the time, maybe, you know, shouldn't have been saying yes to, like, Star Trek covers and stuff like that, I was like, I got to do these Star Trek covers. Yeah, so, no, I get where you're coming uh, from. I mean, uh, you know. Yeah, so, you know, it was a lot of things all at once uh, for, for, like, a year. <laughs> um so i definitely burned out from that and it it's kind of only really now that i'm fully like on the other side of that burnout um hmm. because i had you know like a break from animation and black hammer like i finished black hammer so it was like oh i can just like catch up on some stuff and do some freelance illustration and not you know just kind of chill out for a little bit yeah i mean you didn't have like hardcore looming deadlines um, yeah, yeah yeah so what, what was that like you know working on star trek i mean that's you know that's uh sort of like the dream for many people is that okay now you're drawing uh i'm totally making up an example maybe you never drew them but like now you're drawing like picard <laughs> on, a, on a star trek cover or something you know right right, right. yeah um it's really fun and it's been cool because um, it coincided with, uh, I had done previous work kind of sporadically for Star Trek comic stuff um, with different editors that were, um, both of them were great. Um, but uh, when uh, the editor, uh, Heather Antos came on to kind of took over the Star Trek line. Um, she really has a good sense of like, how are we going to like make these comics like an event? You know, like how are we going to make mm. these things that uh, like a thing that people everyone wants to read, you know, that is like really going to motivate people to jump onto these in a way that is can be difficult with like licensed comics, especially licensed right. comics. Kind of it's not just like oh it's a tie-in comic it's like no it is a must read thing yeah yeah she's she did like a really good job of kind of transforming the star trek line of comics into like a you know kind of like a blockbuster line of comics um and fortunately for me she you know likes uh my work <laughs> and it goes well with, and it goes over well with like the licensors and stuff like that so um yeah so so far I've, I've just done like covers for stuff the the main thing that is i don't know that it's necessarily a surprise about working on it but it, it is weird just how much more fun it is to draw these characters that i love and have loved since i was a little kid like i'll hear people talk about it with like superhero comics um you know when they're like drawing a superhero comic i don't necessarily get that same i mean i i like superhero comics and it would be fun to draw them but um for me i like it's that kind of thing with like the first time i drew like some interiors of even just like like you're drawing the bridge like, of the enterprise yeah like, yeah that's like, that's like being on the bridge almost <laughs> right and like the sh like we did that one like a short uh that was where matt and i wrote it also and so then it was a lot of fun of just like i mean just getting really like nitty-gritty of like okay what year is this story set in and like what are the uniforms like and what shuttle would they use and what class of starship are they on and you know like what kind of aliens are in the away team and all that kind of stuff that uh is you know can be kind of like fun and interesting for the reader um was just sort of like insanely gratifying to, <laughs> to be able to uh participate in that kind of stuff um 
yeah so i totally get it why um you know like people will spend their whole life you know drawing mm. like superhero comics and stuff like that because of like you say you know you grew up loving spider-man and then you get to draw spider-man i totally right. get some just like i'm gonna destroy my body trying, <laughs> drawing yeah Spider-Man. no i mean listen i mean you're life. talking to i mean i'm basically that guy for like writing spider-man um you know, oh, yeah. I don't know if it'll ever happen to me, to be honest, you know, happen for me, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I do, you know, really want to write those kind of characters, but there is an element for me. I've now, you know, as the podcast goes on, I'm probably just going to repeat myself like a, a million times, but I kind of compare it to, I don't know if you've ever like watched Mad Men, but um, there's this thing in Mad Men where in the last season, basically, uh, you know, they're kind of tempting Don Draper with like, but don't you want to work on Coca-Cola? Like, come on. Like you want to work on Coca-Cola. It's that's what it's kind of like for me. Like, like I love like Superman, for instance. Like, like Superman to me, like has like deep like emotional meaning to me. And mm-hmm. like it would be like a dream of mine to like write Superman, like kind of similar to how you're talking about with Star Trek. But it's a little bit like, you know, like I want to work on Coca-Cola. You know, it's a little bit like uh um, right. <laughs> really really like the deeper dream for me is I want to create my own Superman that has as much meaning for people at, you know I mean? I want to create yeah. my own thing that I control and, you know, similar to like, we're talking about uh Jeff, you know, Jeff Lemire on black hammer. Like that would be like the dream for mm-hmm. me. Like he is, he's achieved it. Like to have your yeah. own, it doesn't even necessarily need to be superhero related, uh superhero related, but just to have your own, a universe that was successful and popular enough that like you know jeff lemire if he wanted to he could just do black hammer forever and that's you know it's kind of similar to um it kind of reminds me of like like i mentioned frank herbert and dune before like he kind of achieved the dream like that you you know you make your own thing that you know you can you know herbert went on to do uh six books you know, four of which are good, but I won't say which ones. But uh, uh, no, I mean, who am I kidding? I'd love to say which ones, but I just don't want to waste time on it. But uh, or like, you know, uh, George R. R. Martin is another example where like that for me, that is the dream to be like, you know. Um, yeah. And, you know, the the deeper dream is sort of um, which uh, George seems to sort of be failing at, like, you know, not, you know, you know and I get it because he's old, you know, and he, he's old and he is a multi, multi, multi millionaire. So I completely understand. <laughs> but uh, the deeper dream is to finish it, you know, to be done, which, you know, you know, Jeff Lemire seems to have done with Black Hammer. So he's, he's you know, he's even, you know, achieved the ultimate dream, which is to conclude the thing. And um, George Martin seems to be failing at that, that it's I don't know if he'll ever finish. But um, right, uh, right. I want to ask well, your opinion on one thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I, I and I feel the same way. Where there, there are definitely, there are all kinds of characters that I'm fascinated by, or you know, established worlds that I'm fascinated by, and it would be really fun and. Um, challenging and i think like oh like i have a good idea for that or whatever like there's all kinds of stuff like that and then there's stuff like star trek where it's just like deeply emotionally satisfying just because of my own personal connection right but right it also like you're saying it it does kind of connect back to even since i was a little kid what we were talking about before like you want to create your own kids that loved spider-man and would draw spider-man I didn't draw Spider-Man. I drew my own version of Spider-Man, my own character that I came up with that sure it was a rip off of Spider-Man, but like ever since I was a kid, I definitely was driven to like come up with my own thing. And it sounds like you're in kind of a, a similar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, listen, I, I actually, uh, you know, I used to draw a lot when I was a kid and I do feel like I kind of like from an early age, I kind of realized like, okay, I'm either going to uh, draw every day for the rest of my, like I'm either like in order to be a good artist, you really, you know, you really have to do exclusively that, 
or I could be a writer and like do that. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I made a conscious decision from a relatively early age to like focus all my energy on like writing and to basically stop, you know, <laughs> it's like so sad when I describe it this way, but like basically <laughs> stop drawing. Like, I, I think I could like, not to like, pat myself on the back and who knows, maybe I would have sucked, but like, I think I could have been a good artist, but that would have required me, you know, you know, instead of stopping drawing when I was like 14 or 15 or whatever, it would have required me like yeah. doubling and tripling down for like a decade or more. And instead well, I d did that on a failing writing career. So no, I'm <laughs> kidding. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's embarrassing. I think I would, I would guess that the majority of, comic book writers are people that wanted to draw comics <laughs> yeah no uh, i still uh I, I, like when i'm when i'm writing a script when i'm writing a script I, I kind of like you know as time goes on i kind of feel that i sort of have to like i'm basically drawing the layout in like like a little notebook like knowing completely that like the artist is probably going to change a, a lot of it. And I don't, you know, and that's fine. You know what I'm saying? But in order for me to write the script, I sort of have to know what is the actual page going to look like. But the, yeah, yeah. I was just bringing up the, the art thing just to say, like, I did kind of a mixture. Like I used to love drawing Spider-Man, but then like you said, I'd like kind of create like my own derivative, like, Oh, you know, fly man or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he had a hundred variations of that. And I, I'm a guy also who, uh, I was obsessed with like alternate versions of Spider-Man, like uh, Scarlet Spider, for instance, and like yeah, so that yeah. to create your own. Oh, uh, you know, totally made up. Oh, White Spider or something. You know, I'm making that up. I don't know <laughs> yeah, if it was yeah. that, but I'm saying Spider-Man kind of lends itself, as we've seen with these uh, Into the Spider-Verse like movies. Spider-Man kind of lends himself to alternate versions. So I'm sure I was doing kind of a mixture of both of what you're talking about, creating my own superheroes, but then also, you know, I, I would definitely be down just to draw a picture of Superman or whatever. But um, yeah, I want to get, I want to ask you about one last thing while I've got you. That's going to seem, yeah. this is, this is my big gotcha question. <laughs> moment. So you're, you're a big Star Trek expert, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I have a bit of like a, a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about you know uh william Riker. um yeah. do you remember he had a transporter like accident that created a, a transporter duplicate yeah called uh tom i guess thomas Riker. <laughs> yeah yeah all right so you're with me so far yeah uh my contention to you is that thomas Riker later joins like the maquis and essentially becomes a terrorist and <laughs> my my i i put it i put it to the court that william Riker should be he should be kicked out of starfleet because on a bad day his fucking clone became a terrorist so how are you ever <laughs> what, what if i'm if i'm on the bridge with william Riker. How am I ever going to now, I'm always going to be kind of looking in my peripheral vision, like William Riker, his fucking clone became a terrorist. Like he should look like, <laughs> and they never, do they ever address this? Like, I don't know. Um, I can't remember exactly what like the, like absolutely like final canon status of Thomas Riker was. Well, I guess I'm seeing here, I happen to type it in while well, while we were talking, I, I, he was captured by the Cardassians and sentenced to life imprisonment. This is fucking that guy. Him? Well, <laughs> this fucking guy was in prison for the rest of his life for being a terrorist. <laughs> it says here in the eyes of both Starfleet and the Cardassian Union, too. Brutal. So he was not even, it wasn't even like Starfleet was like, yeah, William Riker's exact he's not even a clone he's a literal he's a duplicate the same guy yeah yeah yeah, I, yeah uh yeah i mean i think listen seth <laughs> <laughs> your your argument is is resting on uh i think a denial of how long and how traumatic the uh life of thomas Riker was Right, once he separated. Living on that planet. He was on a planet. It's not just Riker on a bad day. It's Riker after, uh, you know, like, what, like, 
years. 10 years worth of bad days or something like right, that like right he's like a you know uh he was like a lieutenant or something you know he had the the gold um right he had the gold, the gold uniform when he came up yeah so uh you know he maybe went a little insane on that <laughs> but i'm just saying uh, my point is just listen under the right circumstances like william Riker could have been yeah. basically a terrorist and uh, you know i if i like listen if i'm on the bridge with william Riker after i find out about that i'm always gonna be like I don't know, bro. <laughs> like I'm always gonna be looking over his shoulder, <laughs> making sure he's not, you know, he's not doing anything. Like, but I might, you know, I'm kind of being like tongue in cheek about this. Like my larger sure. point is just to say, like, this is why Star Trek is so good because it's like really like, you know. Um, well, yeah, because I mean that's the other thing is it seems like most everybody else is relatively comfortable with the idea that under different circumstances, Riker would be a terrorist um even as you're saying it really on, the you've thing gotta is be, like, you've got to be with me a little bit here like it's, <laughs> it's like hard to even well i think i mean i think also that the other kind of wrinkle of that is um i mean the maquis had like a pretty just cause um there, i mean there's certainly like Full disclosure, I, I've seen I've seen lots of bits and pieces of Deep Space Nine, but I've never actually like watched all of Deep Space Nine all the way through. So I'm totally even, you know, I'm destroying my own case by saying that. But yeah, I mean, as far as uh, like, I and it's been a little while since I've seen the the Deep Space Nine episodes with uh, with Thomas Riker in them, um, but. Uh, I feel fairly confident in saying that uh, Starfleet uh, cited, like allowing him to just stay in prison in Cardassian prison uh, is uh, an unjust <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Huh. Uh, uh, judgment on uh, what he was actually getting up to. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Uh, I don't. I don't think he went that bad. I don't think he went. You know. Right. Fully. Right. Right. And also, you know, I guess the Cardassians were terrible, like oppressors. I guess. I mean, I'm saying again, I'm saying this as someone who has not really seen it, but uh, I just think it's a, you know, the reason I bring it up is almost kind of just even, just it's just obviously. Well, first of all, obviously, it's funny to me. That's that's right. probably the <laughs> well, number I mean, one reason. But that's one of the fun things about Star Trek. I mean, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, of, I, yeah. What I'm kind of driving it. at is. Uh, is like i don't know if you remember that episode i mean obviously you remember that episode where uh, like data was on trial about whether or not they could yeah. like dissect them like i think there there could have been a sorry the measure of a man is the name yes. of the episode yeah that's one of the top, that's got to be i mean that might be my single favorite episode right there i mean uh i i like the trial episodes i guess is where this is going like i like the drum head you know yeah drum head uh, drum head might be my favorite of the trial episodes like i think you could have basically like a trial episode for Riker. like well we should have like a trial for you buddy because your exact duplicate <laughs> is now in life in prison like and i think you know i think it's sort of these kind of moral ambiguities and like these moral dilemmas are like kind of what make uh star trek interesting i guess yeah and, and i mean i think it's it's like a nice intersection of real kind of interesting moral dilemmas and then also like shows that have really great writing but then are also can be like really silly and dumb hmm. uh, and for you know like with that thomas Riker, my favorite one of my favorite ridiculous moments in all of deep space nine is the reveal that you think it's it opens and you think that it uh william t Riker, the Riker we know and love right uh is doing something uh, and then, you know, kind of like the break right before it goes to the like opening credits um, is that, oh, it's not Thomas Riker or it's not uh, William Riker. It's actually Thomas Riker. And the way that they reveal it is that he pulls off a fake goatee um, <laughs> because uh. the facial hair is the only way that you can <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
or like yeah he has like sideburns that make it look like it's a beard because Riker has a beard but Thomas Riker has a goatee so it's just like this very silly thing uh, where he, he pulls like, off his sideburns it's like sideburns you're like oh it's Thomas Riker like you know part of the fun of it is that it's like kind of dumb <laughs> yeah no I mean I, I feel kind of a similar way about like uh silver age superhero stuff that like you know there's sort of like the silliness is a little bit of part of the appeal you know and it, yeah. it also kind of reminds me of like i'm a big doctor who guy and mm. like you know a lot of those old classic episodes like yes the special effects are terrible but that's kind of why they're awesome though like it's kind of you know it's kind of yeah. the silliness yeah. is kind of fun but uh anyways i don't want to keep you all night man um is yeah, there anything that you uh you know you want to promote i mean i guess uh you are um sorry i'm trying to bring this up literally as i'm talking to you you're malachi ward on instagram yeah um is it also uh yeah same for twitter malachi um, ward on at yeah. malachi ward on twitter um yeah is there like anything you want to promote that's like coming up or that, that people should know about kind of just that um that black camera trade for the for the end that comes out july 31st um and then yeah i'm i'm working on some smaller stuff uh but none none of that has been announced yet so <laughs> um the tale yeah. is all this time yeah <laughs> yeah um but yeah uh maybe the only tease is that uh so Matt and I, Matt Sheen, uh, and I wrote and drew um, Ancestor together. And that's kind of my favorite thing that uh, I've done. Um, and we've been slowly, like, I've had, you know, we've worked on Black Hammer stuff that we drew together. And then, like, I did some Black Hammer stuff solo. And Matt worked on, like, a book for somebody else. And, like, you know, we've been doing other things for the last, like, 10 years um but we're we're slowly chipping away at a thing that we like a, a mini series that we're writing and drawing together um well that's awesome we're gonna start drawing like we're like writing it now and we're gonna start drawing it next year so i there is a a new kind of it's not it's not like a sequel to ancestor but like a follow-up you know it like in the kind of same method as ancestors same type of thing that you know we'll start working on next year so that'll be cool um that's that's at least one thing i can <laughs> talk that's about. awesome man i mean that's kind of exciting news that's like you know the the team's getting back together and it's sort of like you know going back to the beginning of ancestor kind of what you know um coming coming back full circle a little bit um yeah anyways man it was great talking to you uh Hopefully we could do this again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on. Your father was a computer scientist. Your mother was a musician. When the spaceship lands, how do they communicate? That's they... a very good question. I like that. <laughs> You've answered the question. They make music on their computers and they are able to speak to each other. And you see, I'd love to say, you know, I intended that and I realized that was my mother and father, but not until this moment. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for that.